and a welcome to members of the public joining us today. This is the 3rd of March 2022 meeting of the Western and Southern Area Planning Committee, which is one of the three area-based planning committees of the Dorset Council. Our area of remat covers the previous Weymouth and Portland Borough Council and most of the previous West Dorset District Council areas. The planning committee is not a public meeting, but a meeting to, be, uh, meeting to which the public are invited. All attendees must comply with the ruling of the chair. They must not interrupt the meeting or cause undue disturbance. To support this, please switch off your mobile phones or select silent mode for the duration of the meeting. Members of the public are allowed to record or film any part of the meeting. However, they should conform to the protocol for filming and audio recording of public council meetings and not distract the proceedings. Those filming should only focus on those directly involved in the conduct of the meeting. No fire alarms, no fire alarm test is expected. If the fire alarm sounds, can all present leave the building as quickly as possible by way of the closest exit and follow the directions to the nearest assembly point away from the civic offices. Public amenities can be located within the foyer of County Hall adjacent to the main entrance. Members of the public who have given advance notice of their wish to speak on an application will be invited to address the committee for a maximum of three minutes. No material is to be circulated to members of the committee. For the, benef for the bene benefit of the public, my name is Councillor David Shortell, Chairman of this Area Planning Committee, and my Vice Chairman is Councillor Bill Pike. Introducing other members of the committee, Councillor Dave Bower. Good morning, sir. Good morning to you. Councillor Kelvin Clayton. Good morning, Kevin. Councillor Susan Cocking. Councillor Jean Dunseth. Good morning, Jean. Councillor Nick Ireland. Councillor Paul Kimber. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Chair. Councillor Louis O'Leary. Good morning, Louis. Good morning, Chair. Councillor Kate Weller. Good, mo good morning, Kate. <laughs> Councillor Sarah Williams. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Chair. Good morning to you. And Councillor John Worth. Good morning, John. Good morning, Chair. Good morning to you. For information, officers involved in the meeting include Anna Lee, Service Manager, Anne Collins, Western and Southern Area Manager, Emma Telford, Thomas Wilde, Charlotte Loveridge, Planning Officers, Matthew Pokin Hawkes, he's the Project Officer, Hannah Massey, she is the Solicitor, hello Hannah, Susan Hetherington, Highways Officer, Denise Hunt, Democratic Service Officer. Good morning to you all. Apologies. Taking item one on the agenda, the first item is apologies and what we have on apologies, uh, um, um, Denise. Uh, I thought I just received apologies from Councillor Susan Cockley and Councillor Ryan Clark for their Thank you. Declarations of interest. We'll take item two on the agenda. Declarations of interest. Does any member have any declarations of pecuniary or other conflict of interest, bias or predetermination regarding any item on the agenda? Thank you, David. Duly noted. Are there any other declarations of interest? Thank you. Item three on the agenda, minutes. To approve the minutes of the meetings held on the 6th of May, 10th of June, 8th of July, 
9th of September, 30th of September, 4th of November, and the 2nd of December, 2021, and to confirm the minutes of the 6th of January and the 1st of February, 2022. Has all members reviewed the copies of those minutes? Thank you. If members, are, if members are content, I will sign these minutes as a true record of what took place following the meeting. Thank you. If you wish me to read the minutes in full for each of those items, please say so. <laughs> but just remember, this is a three-hour meeting. Okay, uh, public participation, which is item four on the agenda. Only those people who have registered to speak with democratic services will be invited to address the committee. Thank you very much indeed, Louis. I appreciate that. And in view of the fact that Bill Pipe has given his apologies, and he is my vice chairman, I therefore will need a proposition for a vice chairman, Councillor Louis O'Leary. Thank you. Julie uh, proposed and seconded. Are there any other nominations? Then I won't take a vote. Congratulations, Jane. You are my vice chairman. I, and I know now I'm in safe hands. Thank you. I will now continue with item four on the agenda, public participation. Only those people who have registered to speak with democratic services will be invited to address the committee. The order of speaking will normally be the first three in objection, the first three in support, including the applicant or agent. If a ward councillor who is not on the planning committee wishes to address the committee, they will be allowed three minutes to do so. Neither the objectors or the supporters will be questioned except to clarify a point of fact by the chairman. All written statements received by democratic services have been passed to members prior to this meeting. We now take item five on the agenda, planning applications. We have six planning applications before us today for consideration. A comfort break of five or ten minutes will be taken as and when is required. We will now take item 5A on the agenda. That is WP 200705 FUL. And that is Site P, Osprey Key, Ham Beach Road, Portland. And that's for the erection of a drive through coffee shop and nine business units. Use class E and or B8, with associated access parking and landscape works. Now may I ask Dan Wilder, Wilden, is he present? Yes. Dan, could I ask you just to sit down here, please, just in the front row, because uh, I'll be calling on you in a moment to speak. Thank you. And now invite Emma Telford, the case officer, to introduce this item. Over to Emma. presentation. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, this application is at Site P, Osprey Key, Ham Beach Road, Portland. Um, the first slide is showing an aerial photograph of the site and surrounding area. Um, and the application site is pointed to with the red arrow. Um, it's this curved plot of land here, which is currently vacant. Um, the site is located to the north of Ham, Ham Beach Road, um, with the foreshore of Portland Harbour further to the north of the site. And then you've got the Weymouth and Portland National Sailing Academy here, um, with the car parking of the Sailing Academy adjacent to the site. Um, and then you've got the Lidl supermarket um, on the opposite side of Ham Beach Road there. Uh, the next slide shows the proposed site plan. Um, the site is located within the DDB, um, and a small part of the site uh, down here does fall within the Heritage Coast. Um, the site is also within close proximity of the Chesil and Fleet SSSI and SAC. Um, the proposed development involves the erection of a coffee shop um, with a drive through and the drive through lane goes around the building here. And then there is a car park serving the coffee shop as well. Um, and then the other part of the scheme, which has a separate access to that proposed coffee shop, is these um, business units. Um, they're both two-storey and separated into two blocks, which you can see there. Um, and they are located to the rear of the site with car parking um, for them in front. Uh, the next slide shows the proposed elevations of that um, first block of the business units, the slightly larger block. Um, they provide both a frontage onto Ham Beach Road, but also the harbour. Um, amendments were made as part of the scheme to, for the introduction of Portland Stone um, on the kind of ground floor elevation there with cladding above. Uh, the next slide so shows the proposed floor plans, um, again showing the block separated into smaller units um, with access to the first floor units by an external staircases. Uh, so next we have the proposed elevations of that slightly smaller block, um, again the same materials, um, and it does include the provision of wall-mounted electric, electric car charging points, which you can see on the elevation there as well. Um, so again, the floor plan of those commercial units um, separated into, into smaller um, units. Next up, we have the proposed elevations of the coffee shop and drive through. Um, the supporting information to the application does set out that this would be occupied by Starbucks. Um, and although some signage is shown there on those plans, um, that would be separate, um, would be part of a separate advertisement consent application. Uh, as you can see there, uh, wooden, wooden cladding is proposed, um, and this would be viewed in relation to the um, Lidl located opposite, but also the <coughs> signage of that Lidl as well. Um, so next up, we've got the floor plan of the coffee shop, um, and that does include an area for consumption on the premise, so it isn't just a, a drive through The next slide is to show a proposed section and to show that relationship. Um, so you've got the proposed business unit here, and then you can see it in relation to the existing Lidl supermarket, which is located on the opposite side of um, Ham Beach Road. And obviously, the proposal would sit in the wider concept context of Osprey Key. Okay. Next up, I've got some photographs of the site. Um, so this first photo is taken coming away from the roundabout of Ham Beach Road and Portland Beach Road. Um, you can see the application site in the foreground, and then you can see the uh, National Sailing Academy and the car parking for that there as well. 
Uh, the next photo is that same viewpoint, but with a slightly wider context. So you can just see the car park of the Lidl opposite um, in that photo as well. And again, the next one is similar viewpoint, but showing um, more detail of the existing site. And then the next set of photos are from the direction of the Sailing Academy, looking back at the site and back to that roundabout um, there. And then again, a similar viewpoint, but showing the more detail of the site. And again, um, slightly further detail of the site there as well. In terms of the key planning issues, um, in terms of principal development, the site is located within the DDB, um, and it also falls within the allocation port one, which allows for employment and ancillary retail use. The coffee shop um, would also be a complementary to the mix of uses, um, uses already at Osprey Key. Um, in terms of visual amenity, amendments were made as part of the scheme, which were the, include the introduction of the Portland Stone, um, areas of planting and changes to the boundary treatments. Um, it's considered those amendments and the location in relation to the existing built form of Osprey Key, um, it would not result in an adverse impact. Uh, in terms of residential amenity, it is considered that the site is located um, a sufficient distance away from residential properties. Um, during the process, concerns were raised about the impact of the scheme on prevailing winds and the impact that could have on water spots. Um, but in response to that, a wind condition study was undertaken and that concluded that effects would be minor and localised. And in response to that study, um, the Weymouth and Portland National Sailing Academy, the Chesil Sailing Trust and the official test centre uh, withdrew their concerns. Um, in terms of highway safety, highways have raised no objections. Um, in terms of biodiversity, a BP has been agreed, um, including a financial contribution for the loss of habitat. Um, and an appropriate assessment was undertaken and no adverse effects on the integrity of the designated sites was the conclusion. Um, the recommendation for the scheme is set out um, as updated on the update sheet, um, and that is to delegate authority to the head of planning or service manager for development, for development management and enforcement to grant subject to a legal agreement um, for a financial contribution uh, for compensation of the loss of habitat for the, the figure set out on the screen. Um, and it is also subject to the comments of the Environment Agency in relation to the requirement to prevent the use of the commercial buildings as EE, which is the provision of medical or health services, um, and EF, which is creche, day nursery or day centre. Um, and this is because the EA raised no objections subject to less vulnerable um, development. Uh, the site is vulnerable to storm events which could overtop Chesil, um, the Chesil Beach. The current condition, as set out as part of the recommendation, um, would prevent those medical uses and nursery uses. Um, this was questioned by the applicant, so we are engaging and seeking further clarification from the EA. That could result in the condition remaining as is as part of the recommendation, or it could result in the condition being amended to allow for any of those uses that fall within Class E. Um, and then obviously subject to the conditions that are set out, um, there's the, uh, the plans list and the time period, um, the use classes for the commercial business units, there's a condition that um, means that any large units couldn't be used for retail, um, the conditions of the drive-through coffee shop, and then materials, lighting scheme, turning and parking as shown, um, the vision of electric charging points, an unexpected land contamination condition, the provision of a construction environmental management plan um, for the scheme to be carried out in accordance with the agreed BP, um, the submission of a landscape and ecology management plan, um, and there's conditions there for provision of litter bins and time-limited parking signage, and they are to do with 
um, limiting the recreational impacts on the Cheselin fleet, uh, condition to be carried out in accordance with the flood risk assessment, um, a scheme for flood warning and emergency evacuation notices, and then the standard drainage conditions there as well. Um, but that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Emma. I will now invite uh, uh, Mr. Dan Wilder to address the committee. Please, direct, uh, please speak directly into the microphone and you have a maximum period of three minutes. Uh, Dan. So over to you. Good morning, members. I just wanted to begin by introducing the applicant Tidebank UK Limited. Tidebank have been heavily involved with the redevelopment of Osprey Quay since 2008. And since then, they have built or acquired around 8,500 square metres of commercial property at Ospey Quay, investing millions in the area. They built 16 units at the Maritime Business Centre, 12 units at Navigator Park, another 10 units alongside in Mearside, five units at Victoria Park. They revived the former Sixth Form College into a thriving community and business hub with further expansion planned. By their reckoning, they have already provided employment space at Osprey Key for around 250 local jobs. They've also sold around 5,000 square meters of space back to local business owners to help them invest and further embed their business into the now thriving Portland economy. Important to the Tide Bank business model is that they don't just develop sites and then walk away. They're all about investing in the area for the long term driving job creation by providing commercial premises which tracked business through good quality, flexible buildings and creating desirable business locations. The application site is a small marginal strip of leftover land when Ham Beach Road was built. The site has been available for development for around two decades, but it is not until now that a concrete proposal has come forward. The proposal, as you've seen, is split into two halves. First, we have 18 small flexible commercial units suitable for a wide range of potential uses. We envisage some demand may simply be for offices with a desirable harbour view, but most likely we would expect to attract interest from plenty of small firms looking to benefit from the location adjacent to the sailing academy and with a strong maritime connection. The emphasis here is about creating flexible units to maximise interest in what will be a very difficult market and in doing so, create as many job opportunities as possible. The second part is the drive-through coffee shop. It's important to remember here that the planning is about the use and not the end user. But we'd like to clarify that the actual prospective tenant is not Starbucks, but a UK company based in Hampshire called 23.5 Degrees Limited, the first franchise partner of Starbucks in the UK. Starting from scratch in 2013, now, now employ around 1,500 people in the UK, having invested over 28 million in the UK economy. Each site such as this will typically employ around 12 full-time staff and a further eight part-time. I hope you agree that this proposal represents an excellent opportunity to secure further investment into Osprey Key from Tidebank, a company who have already done so much to create this desirable and thriving business area. There is a question here as to what you want to see at this gateway site to Portland, but what my client wants to see is investment, job creation, and more business activity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Thank you Mr. Ryan. Are there any questions of a technical nature for the case officer? Councillor Kimber. Uh, yes, yes, I can. Thank you. Have you pressed your microphone? <coughs> okay, I'm, I'm, it's uh, appropriately read now. Um, just, to, just to notify you, I'm the ward councillor. Um, I've won the, uh, the, the, this is a, obviously a, a, a good development, bring about jobs. My concern is uh, this council spent an awful lot of time regarding trying to get people to use their cars less. And my thinking is the impact of a drive-through 
coffee shop, how that could, does that um, deter from what we were trying to do, just trying to, to save uh, Dorset Council, we were trying to very much bring about a better environment and I'm just wondering wh how that sits with, with that, th that thinking that we spent an awful lot of time dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. How do you, how how does that sit with all the work we've done regarding the environment? Thanks, Councillor Kimber. Would you like to come back on that, please? Um, yes. Yeah, so I'd come back and say that obviously the proposal is located within the defined development boundary, so it isn't taking people travelling further distances to get there, and also it, it is located just off that main. Um, Portland Beach Road. So I think it, it would be picking up on people that are already already driving through um, that location. So, sorry, Chair, if I can come back. So we don't see it contravening the work that we were trying to do to save the environment. You, you're seeing it as people that are driving already. Councillor O'Leary, did you have a question? Thank you, Chairman. Um, it, I may have missed it in the uh, report, but was there any comment? Am I on? Um, uh, is, there, is there a comment from the Town Council at all on this? I can't remember seeing one. I didn't see it in the report earlier. Uh, Council Councillor Kimber. Uh, just to help on that, it's our, uh, number nine on the constable team. Councillor Willey. Um, in, in the formation question, um, simply to say, are the applicants the landowners or do this, does the land belong to somebody else? Are you able to ask? Can I ha can that ba hand you that back to you, Emma, please? We're just looking it up. I think your question may have been answered there. Yeah, yes, thank you. No. Oh. Councillor Duncan. Um, in the officer's report, there is mention of a fence, quite a high fence, I believe, that goes around the site. Could you tell me a little more about that, please? Um, so when I said about amendments being made to boundary treatments, that was one of the amendments made. Um, so that it resulted in the removal of um, what was originally proposed, which was high close bordered fences. That has since been removed from the proposed scheme. Any further technical questions? Right, before I open the debate, members, may I remind you to direct any questions or remarks through the chair, and I will invite members to speak in turn. Can I also remind members to speak directly into the microphones, which should be kept on mute when not speaking to preserve audio quality. I now open the debate to members. Councillor O'Leary. Uh, 
The only concern I have really around this development is the issue of traffic. Um, we know that Portland Beach Road is a very busy road. Um, it's just in the paper today um, about the speed limit along there. Um, I remember when Liddles went in, there was an issue around access to the Lidl site and yellow lines had to be put in retrospectively due to the bus route. Um, so I am quite concerned about extra traffic going along on those back roads or side roads off Portland Beach Road. Um, I know there's been no formal objection from highways, but is there anything going to be put in place to help try and make sure that we don't get a similar situation that we have had on other roads similar to that in the area? Thank you very much for the question, Councillor Um Yeah, the Highway Authority have identified there is actually no need for that. Thank you. Wish to come back, uh, Councillor Lewin. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, my argument was, though, the, the, the Highways Authority argued the same on Liddles, I believe, and then that was retrospectively put in because there clearly was an issue after it was built. Um, I'm just a bit concerned that we could end up with the same situation. Thank you, Councillor Leary. Chair, if I may respond, um, you didn't introduce me in your uh, initial appraisal, but I, my name's Steve Savage. I'm the Transport Development Manager. I have attended your committees before. I think, good morning to you. Um, just in answer to Councillor O'Leary's question there, that we're confident that there's sufficient car parking within the site curtilage to accommodate the parked vehicle, so we're not anticipating there's any need for any additional parking measures or restrictions on the approach roads. The, as um, Emma mentioned, the uh, traffic's already, or the majority of it will be drive by trips are on the network al already. So we're not anticipating that there'll be a major impact on traffic flows in the vicinity. So the simple answer to your question, Councillor, is that we haven't identified that there are any need for any offsite works to be carried out as a consequence of this. Obviously, as with Liddles, if it proves to be at a later date that retrospectively we need to do something as an authority, that's what we're going to have to do. But we have no justifiable planning reason here to say that we cannot support this application in highway safety terms. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Councillor Kimber. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've asked my questions regards, uh, regard, regarding the uh, takeaway coffee, but uh, a cafe would be superb in, in that area. Um, I think this application will bring jobs to, to our community and already Osprey Quay has become a thriving little industrial area, which I think is can only help support our local community on Portland. Um, I was speaking to um, the manager of the I'm name dropping now, but I was speaking to the manager of the marina over in Portland, and he's uh, there and he's telling me that the marina is absolutely thriving and people, more people are coming to uh, use the marina for, to uh, park their boats. Um, so the area will bring, bring about jobs. Um, I, I would make one area that a local employer did say to me once, it would be good if we could have somewhere temporary uh, that an industrial unit could go into whilst they're contracting possibly in in and around the, um, the the Portland Harbour or work. But companies tend to move into an area and work in that area for a few months and then move on. So there would be an interest, I, I think, that we could have some uh, a building that could be used in that. But I'm happy to move, to, uh, move this chair and... Uh, hope uh, this council and councillors can support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kember. Councillor Weller. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, well, I, I, I hate to disagree with Councillor Kember, actually. Um, and I was involved in a lot of the development on the overall site over the last 20 years. Um, in discussions as, as buildings went up and indeed officially opened a number of them. So I'm not opposed to the developments there. I am opposed to the developments in this particular site because it is desperately close to what is an absolute treasure to 
Weymouth and Portland people. Um, if it was anywhere else, I, I wouldn't have a problem. But, but right there, blocking the view of people use the word iconic um, overly, in my view, and I don't think the Salem Academy is iconic, but it is most certainly significant. Um, and this will, will now actually come round into Hamby Beach Road. That, that view of that will be blocked. And that was a significant incident in the history of Weymouth and Portland be, being the host of the 2012 Olympics. Um, I disagree that we badly need a cafe there. Um, we have two cafes and restaurants on the site already, both thriving, I know, and both very busy, so perhaps there you know, is scope for an additional, but to suggest that there isn't any. There is another one just opposite, and there's another one on the same side of the road, um, a little further down, and then yet another one close to the castle. So it's not short of coffee outlets in the area. They already exist, um, so it's not fulfilling an, a need, in my view. I think the small units will get filled up because there are lots of people wanting to, unemployed people wanting to chance their arm at getting back into employment. Um, I have no planning reason whatsoever because it is within the development boundary and therefore if I were to say I'm going to propose refusing, I know you would all say, well, what are your reasons? And I don't have any other than that. I don't think this development should be built on that site. Um, and I will be voting against it for that reason. But I know I'm wrong to do so, Terry. Thank you, Councillor Weller. Councillor King. Agree here with is, um, Councillor Weller. I have no objection, as far as I can tell, against the industrial units on the site. Um, but I think I would find it incredibly difficult to vote in favour of a development that encourages the use of car. And I'm just thinking here of the drive through unit. We should be encouraging active travel, not encouraging car use. Um, and I, in all honesty, Chair, I don't think I could vote in support of anything that's encouraging driving. Thank you, Councillor Clayton. Councillor O'Leary. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm happy to second Councillor Kimber on, on this one. Any other speakers? If there's no more deliberation and members are content they've heard the entire presentation and debate, I will seek a proposal, which I've already got, and a seconder. For both recommendations, that's recommendation A and B, I need to clarify really before we take the vote as to that, that proposal and seconding is referring to both A and B recommendations. Well, I'm happy to second both of those, provided Councillor Kimber's happy to propose. Okay, therefore we have a, a, a proposal and a seconder. Chair, sorry, just to be clear, will that also include the update sheet, the amended recommendation in the update sheet to recommendation A? Thank you. Is that correct, uh, Councillor Kimbe? Yeah, the, the a sheet that came in late yesterday afternoon, am I correct? Yeah. And uh, whether there's one proposal, I, I, I wonder if it might, might help members as there's a bit of confusion whether it's put up on the, um, up on our screen. Can you see those, uh, Councillor Kimball?
Are you happy with this? And I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay, we have a proposal on a seconder. We have no more speakers, so we'll now take a vote by roll call. Uh, now take a vote by a show of hands. All those in favour? Those against? Any abstentions? Thank you, Mr. Don Wilder. Uh, uh, you may uh, move back to the auditorium if you wish to stay. Thank you. Right, members and uh, uh, members of the public, we have we now go on to item five uh, B on the agenda, and that is P V O C, which is a, a, um, a variation of conditions, twenty twenty one o five five one o, Marchesi House, uh, Poplar Close, Weymouth, D T four nine U N, and that's for the de demolition of existing flats and erection of 18 houses and 13 flats in two blocks. Variation to condition seven of planning approval, WP 18-00914 FUL, construction of management plan. And before I continue, may I ask uh, uh, some speakers who wish to con uh, uh, contribute to this particular item, uh, uh, Mr. John Dixon. Yes. Could I ask you to move down to the front, please, sir, John? Uh, 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 Mr. Scott. Scott Fenner and councillors Peter Barrow and councillor David Gray. Thank you, gentlemen. I now invite Matthew Pokin Hawkes, the case officer, to introduce this item. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Okay, this application is for Marchese House. The application seeks to vary planning condition seven of the approved development to allow a revised construction access. Original planning permission was granted for the demolition of Marchese House and construction of 18 homes and 13 flats. The site is located within the Southfield area of Weymouth on the east side of Radipole Lane. At the moment, the site is a vacant block of flats to the north is Sycamore Road, which leads to Southfield Primary School, around 200 metres away. To the east is Rowan Close, a residential street. To the south is Southfield Local Service Centre, with the John Gregory Pub and other shops and services. A footpath runs to the east of the site, which connects into a series of other footpaths in the local area. Poplar Close is the name of the road immediately in front of Marchese House. It's essentially the 
the forecourt parking area for Mulcasey House. The only existing vehicle access to the site is from Rowan Close leading to Poplar Close. This is an aerial photo, shows a footpath along the east of the site, clearer, and to the south you can see the service road, which services John Gregory and the other shop units. Planning history. In June 2020, planning permission was granted for the demolition of Marchese House and construction of 18 houses and 13 flats. The approved development is affordable housing led and the applicant is Bournemouth Churches Housing Association. Planning permission was subject to a number of planning conditions and a section 106 tying down the affordable housing. One of those planning conditions was condition number seven, requiring construction traffic management plan to be submitted and approved. That condition was discharged last year in July and that, that condition specified that construction access had to be from Radipole Lane. This plan shows the approved site plan. You can see that the development uses the existing access into the site to serve the houses and flats and houses and flats front Radipole Lane to the west. This visual shows a view from Radipole Lane with a block of flats on the corner and houses further south. This is the wording of condition seven, requiring construction access from Radipole Lane only. At the time the previous permission was determined, highways had no objection to the use of the existing access to the site for construction vehicles. The requirement for this condition to specify that access could only come from Radipole Lane was a request from members of the public and the ward councillor. At the time, the applicant agreed with the condition wording. This is the approved traffic management plan, which was approved last year when the condition was discharged. What you can see is a construction access on the south of the site from the service road off Radipole Lane leading into the site. The applicant, since discharging that condition, have advised that they are unable to use it for construction vehicles. The reasons being they cannot obtain legal rights over the land. They do not own the adjacent land um, to the south, which is in a layer of different ownerships. And from a, pra a practical perspective, they've said that they've investigated access along the west of the site, but because of the layout of development with homes along this western boundary, they're unable to provide of revised access along that side. So that brings us to what we're looking at today, which is the proposed amendment of the approved scheme to allow access from the existing site entrance. The application is to vary that planning condition, number seven, and what the applicant has submitted are three documents which explain the, the proposed measures to, to mitigate the um, construction, construction risks and highways impacts of that change. So the documents are the construction environmental management plan, a construction phase plan, and a traffic management plan. If approved, development would need to be carried out in accordance with these documents. Condition number seven would be amended to require that, and that would provide a means to take enforcement action should construction not proceed in line with those documents. This is the revised traffic management plan. What you can see is the construction vehicle access is proposed to use the existing vehicle access to the site from Rowan Close. And there's a location for two traffic marshals in this construction plan, one on the main entrance and one on the junction of Sycamore Road and Radipole Lane. What the documents set out are that deliveries would enter, or construction vehicles would enter the um, site here, but before they do, they are met by the traffic warden who would walk the construction vehicle round and enter the site through this direction. The documents set out a number of measures 
to control construction. And I'll just summarize a few of those, those points relevant to amenity and highways. So in terms of highways, deliveries are required to fall outside of, of school start and finish times. So there'll be no deliveries between 8.15 and 9.15 or 2.45 and 1.45. All construction traffic must be met by a traffic mar marshal at the junction here before being guided round to the main entrance. Reversing is prohibited without a banksman or traffic marshal supervision. Vehicle speeds are limited to five miles an hour and subcontractors are required to park in the car park to the south at the, the, the local shops and services rather than on surrounding roads. In terms of amenity, the document set out a wheel wash facility. They have standard hours of construction um, between Monday and Friday, eight till six, and Saturday, eight till one. They require no idling of, of vehicles, and they require that the, the, the contractor maintains communications with local residents through meetings. So the main issues of this, of this case, the, the principle of development, that's, that's not in question. The, the permission, the principle was established by the previous consent on the site. It's a sustainable location. It's within the urban area. It's within the DDB. Most of the pub public objections, of which there are 53, relate to highways and amenity. In terms of highways, the Highways Authority stand by comments on the initial application that the applicant, that the existing access is suitable for construction. The use the existing access is not considered to give rise to any highway safety concerns and the documents provided by the applicant are considered to appropriately manage construction from a highways perspective. In terms of amenity, construction is always disruptive. However, the measures outlined in the documents are considered to appropriately manage construction from, a, from an amenities perspective and the measures set out are very similar to the measures approved previously when that condition was discharged. In terms of habitat sites, funding towards Cheslin the Fleet is taken from, from SIL, the SILS pot. Um, that will appropriately mitigate um, additional recreational pressure on Cheslin the Fleet, and that's been confirmed through the appropriate assessment process and Natural England confirmation. The recommendation is to grant um, plan permission subject to the revised planning conditions, the main one being condition number seven for development to be carried out in line with the submitted documents and a deed of variation to secure the affordable housing provision. Part B of the, the same recommendation is for permission to be refused if the deed of variation is not agreed within six months or another reasonable agree agreed timeframe. So that concludes my presentation, Chair. Thank you very much, Matthew. I now invite John Dixon to address the committee. John, you have three minutes. Oh, I apologize, I'll uh, tone my voice down now. Um, we are not averse to the development going ahead at South Hill. It will apply affordable housing to a community that is well needed in these times. However, Bournemouth churches have shown a total contempt for the planning process since planning was first granted. Their immediate action on being told that there was a restriction to come in via Radipole Lane was to put in hard hoardings all along the Radipole Lane entrance site. 
therefore depriving themselves access for larger vehicles. This site could have been demolished by now and we wouldn't be having this meeting. They further compounded matters by bringing in 24 to 36 feet skips, contrary to the planning permission they were granted, one of which was dropped outside our house and left for a period of 14 hours. I did contact the um, developers at the time and they did actually get it moved, but the driver would not return that night. Subsequently, we could not go out of our house. We have also had instances of refuse collection of the toilets where the pump wagon was outside our house, discharging the effluent from the site toilets. We could not go out. We are not averse to this, but what we are saying is, had the development done what they said they were going to do and gone via Radipol Lane, this place would be developed. This place would be a flat building site that they could have worked from. They have deprived themselves of six months, not the residents. And I also question highways as well. Every diagram we see on there in the original drawing and also in this current drawing bears no resemblance of what the streets look like. I have a transit van. I struggle to get out today. Why? Because people park their cars. I did challenge Drew Smith to bring down their biggest lorry and show us how they would get it onto the building site. This was ignored by BCHA, something we're not surprised by. What we're saying is nothing has changed. Nothing has changed in South Hill. The original agreement stands as it should do. And I ask you to turn down this application. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'll now invite uh, Scott Fenner to address the committee. Scott, over to you. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Scott Fenner, and I'm the technical manager for Drew Smith, who is the appointed contractor partner for BCHA in the delivery of this important site. We were appointed to this role in April 2021, following a detailed selection process. Oh, sorry, is it quiet? It is on. We understand that BCHA, via their planning consultant, previously sought to address these neighbours' concerns with a proposal to serve the development directly from Radipole Lane. In seeking to comply with this, discussions have been held with the freeholders and leaseholders of this private lane to the south of the site, but we do not have rights and unfortunately agreement could not be reached. Alongside these discussions, other options have been explored, including a new temporary access along Radipole Lane. However, this presents its own issues due to the frontages of plots 8 to 14 and Block B alongside level issues, which is why it's not considered to be the safest approach. Your officer's report and presentation has been very clear, and so I don't want to repeat what has already been explained in detail. Given the limited time, it's probably best for me to focus on the measures that we will implement to ensure the safety of all during the construction of these new homes. We are proposing to implement the submitted traffic management plan, which covers the following. No deliveries between the school times of 8.15 and 9.15 and 2.45 to 3.45. Two traffic marshals with one situated on the corner of Radipole Lane and Sycamore Road. The other will be situated at the site entrance. All deliveries will be escorted from Radipole Lane down Sycamore Road, Rowan Close and Poplar Close to the site entrance. No deliveries will be kept on Radipole Lane or surrounding roads. All contractors will be instructed to park by the nearby car park. And I believe from checking there are around 70 spaces within this car park, of which we need to use a maximum of 30. Local residents will be given the site manager's mobile phone number to voice any concerns or highlight any issues, although we do not foresee any. To conclude, as a company, we're experienced in delivering such constrained brownfield sites. As well as road safety, we'll work hard to maintain contact with the local community, to build relationships with those directly affected, and to minimize disturbance so far as possible. We respectfully request you follow your officer's recommendation to permit this application. Thank you.
Thank you, Scott. I will now invite Councillor Peter Burrow to address the committee. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. First, I want to make it clear that I am not opposed to the development as it provides a range of homes that are desperately needed to meet the needs of residents. The objections that local residents and myself outlined during the original application related to the density of the development and access to the site. Some 220 residents made objections to the original plans and over 50 have objected to this application. We asked for access to be via Radipole Lane as our view is that Sycamore Road and Rome Close are totally unsuitable as they are very minor roads of limited width and are only suitable for access to a small residential area. Sycamore Road is a cul-de-sac and is the access route to Southfield Primary School. As a school governor who regularly walks a grandchild to and from school, I know the road well and it is extremely busy at school opening and closing times. The idea of school children making their way to and from school along a narrow residential road whilst heavy goods vehicles are manoeuvring on those same roads at the same time is so dangerous it cannot be allowed. The developer has now offered safety measures to reduce the risk and they are welcome, but they are dependent on consistent implementation over a prolonged period of time. Our experience of developers complying with conditions at other sites in our ward has been extremely disappointing, with local residents suffering the negative effects. I am not casting dispersions on the developer in this case, but I hope you understand our concerns as we're considering conditions that aim to keep young school children safe, and these cannot be allowed to fail. Highways made no objection to the originally, nor subsequently, as we've heard. So highways made no objection when the developer was not offering the safety measures they are now offering. So highways would have been happy to see Sycamore Road used as site access with no additional safety measures in place. I'm sorry, but I simply do not accept their opinion then, and I do not accept it now. And this is the risk assessment that has been done for this site. And this risk assessment puts the likelihood of an accident on that road with heavy goods vehicles, as we've described, at four, which is likely. So how can highways come to a view that there are no safety considerations at all when this risk assessment quite clearly says there are? The developer has claimed that access via Radipole Lane is impossible, but has not provided much evidence to back up this claim. I understand it would increase timescales and costs, and I can quite understand why a developer would wish to avoid both of these. But they do not make access via Radipole Lane impossible. They just make it, they just get, have some disadvantages. I have sought advice from trade sources and they made the point that the road layout and the footings could all be done at the same time. And the footings for the three plots at the bottom of the road could then be covered with stone and used, access, used as an access road for the duration of the main build. These three foundations could then be uncovered and the three homes constructed. So it's not impossible when it's been done elsewhere. And lastly, good health and safety management is to try and eliminate the thing that creates the risk. In this case, using Sycamore Road for access. Only if this cannot be done, do you try to reduce the risk by using additional safety measures, as those suggested. The downside of the second approach is the risk remains, especially if the safety measures are not always implemented effectively. I remain convinced that access to the site should be via Radipole Lane, as this actually removes the risk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I now call on um, Councillor David Gray to address the committee. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. I'll, um, I'll try and distill that, because this uh, variation is about two things. One is the risk, and the second is about the amount of profit that the developer's going to make. Now, since the planning was granted in June 2020, nothing has changed. The plan is still the same, the road is still the same width, the children still go to school, after school clubs still happen, children still walk down that path. Nothing has changed. And that's why the um, plan was put in place in the first place, to mitigate the risk. So the risk still exists. 
Now, the proposed mitigation by the developer, um, in my experience uh, recently in the last couple of years, the enforcement action by this council on developers who fail to act according to the plan has been really poor. Uh, in the last development in my ward, over 20 breaches uh, of a, a traffic management plan, no action was taken by this council. So the risk still exists. I've got little faith in the plan. I would say, however, that on the second issue of cash, the two alternatives for this site um, that were explored when it was originally granted plan of mission, that is the access from the private road at the back of the John Gregory pub. Uh, Bournemouth Church has admitted to me that in negotiations with the landowner, that the amount of money that the private landowner was asking was prohibitive to their uh, model. So it is still possible, they just don't want to pay the cost of that. The second alternative off of uh, Radipole Lane, um, again in discussions with Bournemouth churches, suggests that the final three houses would be compromised because they would need to use that as the access. All that does is extend the build time of the development. So again, it's about the amount of money. I ask you to, to um, and, and I think the 53 objectors are asking you to stick to its original plan. When you made the decision in June 20, this council said that to mitigate risk, the access needed to be from one of two alternative entrances. Um, I don't see that you can make any other decision other than to stick to that original uh, objection. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gray. Now I'm going to call on Matthew Folk and Hawks to respond with any salient points he may wish to clarify. Thank you, Chair. In terms of the, um, the measures that the, the applicants have done to investigate um, alternative access, um, the Council's property team has sought to, to try and help that along and um, provide access along the southern boundary. That hasn't been possible through those discussions, which brings us to where we are now. Um, stepping back from this development, um, it is usual for development to take place in dense urban areas, indeed by, by schools, when schools are doing their own urban um, regeneration works. So where, where we're coming from on this application is to try and ensure that those works to this site operate in a way that is appropriate from an amenity and a highways perspective. And that's how the, council's, the council has assessed the application. Um, I'd like to invite my highways colleague just to respond on any of, any of the highway points. Thank you for that. Thank you, Matthew. No, no, I'm not taking calls. Um, I'm now, are there any points to be raised by highways or any relevant councillor of, and council officer? Thank you, Chair. Um, the highway authority's view is, is unchanged, um, and I just think there needs to be some clarity with that. So. Um, the existing access, as it is at the moment, provides a workable access because it has good visibility displays, the geometric design is sound, and we have low traffic speeds in the area. Um, we would not have refused or objected on highway grounds um, because it doesn't meet the criteria that would be considered severe. Um, Having said that, if we had been asked to look at Radipole Lane as a proposed access, which we weren't at the time, um, just on face value, um, we, we potentially would have um, had a no objection. So like for like, they aren't very different. Um, however, we'd still be contemplating 
um, all of the concerns for members of the public and highway users about pedestrian safety. Um, but you know, they would the access to Raddy Pole Lane would have been appraised based on the visibility displays, the geometric design, and the the traffic speeds. Now, um, construction work um, it's perceived to be dangerous, and generally it can be an inconvenience. So what we tend to do is we look at the, we've looked at the construction traffic management plan, um, and the highway authority have welcomed the robust nature that's been presented by the applicant. Um, it's a very bespoke risk assessment for pedestrians um, and for those that are vulnerable. Um, and it really goes further than what we would have, we would have probably seen before. Um, and those are the likelihood of the risks, the fact that there's, um, we need to look at mitigation to bring those risks down. Um, and with the traffic marshals that are being proposed, um, avoiding larger deliveries at these peak hours, um, having banksmen on site, and this ongoing engagement with the local community um, is, is all welcomed. Um, so in terms of um, access, and just dealing with that, um, the access that's existing that um, is, is from Radipole Lane onto Sycamore Road. And that's a seven metre wide carriageway. Actually, it goes a bit deeper than that. And it's flanked by footways either side. Um, then you turn into Rowan Close and then Poplar Close. And they're six metres wide, which is easily enough to accommodate a larger vehicle with a parked vehicle. However, if you're turning in from Sycamore Road onto Rowan Close, if anybody's parking there, that's, if anything contravenes the highway code, that could be you know, within 10 metres of parking opposite a junction and at a junction, um, that becomes an amenity issue. So it is very difficult for us to make comment on that. Um, with regards to um, alternative safe routes, now I myself have been to the site quite a few times and I am quite familiar with the area. Um, so I've actually witnessed the, the way in which the um, children are taken to school and they're picked up. Um, there are quite a lot of alternative safe pedestrian routes. Um, so we've got, if you're using the car park itself, um, and then um, you've got Radipole Lane via the shop fronts, and you can actually avoid the site completely. Um, but um, there are alternative um, routes that are also publicised on the South Hill School website. Um, a few years ago, they published what was termed a park and stride scheme, which was encouraging parents to park away from the school, notably in the um, private communal car park, and take a slight detour uh, four or five minutes from the car park to the school, which would actually um, diminish the risk completely. So the, it, would, it would take away any need to cross a road. Um, it was well lit and um, well maintained. Um, just one moment, please. Can I just come in there, Chair? The additional point here is that this is a Dorset Council endorsed Park and Stride scheme, endorsed by Sustrans, which is an off road route. It's an alternate route, which is meant to encourage, obviously, the parents and the children to walk to the school, for, which meets one of our council's um, objectives with regards to health and well being. A parent myself, if I saw a construction site in front of me, and I saw a short section of footway that was going near it, but there was an alternate which I could walk, which was clear of it, I'd be walking the alternate route. Uh, there's no need for anybody to actually walk past this site during the construction period. If they do, then the Drew Smith themselves have put in appropriate measures to try and manage that, particularly avoiding school times. I mean, we do look at that quite, look quite a lot on traffic management plans such as this. Um, they've endorsed that, they've agreed with it, so sh there should be a very little or no conflict with regard to that. The view that we're taking as a highway authority is that we could not sustain any form of highway refusal on this on grounds of safety. And as Susan mentioned, it doesn't comply with the MPPF in terms of being severe. So that's where we're coming from. We appreciate that there's local concern. There's concern about parking. There's concern about impact on pedestrians and school children particularly. But we feel that there are suitable alternatives here, which would mean that you would not need to go past the site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Highways. All right. Uh, okay. 
I'm now going to ask if there's any technical questions from the committee to officers. Right, no, shall we get them in order? Yeah. Okay. I think Kim, Councillor Kim Roberts. I think Councillor Clayton was first, actually. Okay. Okay. Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Chair. Um, being a bit cheeky, this isn't directly to an officer. I'm going to ask for permission if I could invite either Councillor Gray or Barrow to comment on the tra highways officer's report that there is an alternative pathway. I don't know the area. I would just like to get a view of somebody who does know the area as to the suitability of that alternative. Would that be possible? I think that should be done, that should be addressed to a, a, an officer rather than a speaker. Yeah, can I just uh, come in on that because there is a re relevant issue here? I will allow that. Everything the highways officer said is just true. The trouble is the highways officer is living in their perfect world and I'm dealing with a school where I'm a governor that is not a perfect world. A vast number of the parents actually drop their children off on their way to work and therefore they drive. We have, as he's, the officer said, it's quite true, we have tried very hard to get people to car, park in the car park and to walk to school. Right? We, you know, we've been doing that for several years with limited success. We have more success in the afternoons, I have to say, but the other trouble is that when people walk to the school, again, there are different routes to get there, which could avoid the site, that's true, but people don't use them because they want to get to school in a hurry. And that's the bottom line. People are busy, both parents work. So yes, what's said is true, but it's not actually what happens in general in practice. There are some, people, some parents and families that do it, I quite accept that, but vast, vast numbers don't. My overall fear on this is that if the parents are worried, they will tend to actually stop, uh, stop walking altogether and they will all drive and then we'll end up with chaos at the school gates. Who is next? Um, yep. Uh, Councillor Kimber. Um, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, my technical question, or my question is, could you again put, put up the road layout and plans around, uh, around this area? I'm looking at the representation from the head teacher of Southfield Primary School, who is, is very concerned about promoting an active travel plan to get to that school. And uh, I am particularly want to know how, how we're going to deal, deal with that. I mean, my experience is most parents, as uh, Councillor Barrow has said, take their children to school on the way to work, drop them at the school gates for safety, and... Uh, and come in there. So if I can be told how we're going to do that, please. Thank you. Can I hand that back to you? Okay. Thank, uh, thank you for the question there. And um, please, please step in highways if, um, if, you, if you wish. So the, the, school, the school gates are there. Um, and the, the site the site is here. Um, understand from highways that the school does have a um, recommendations for students and parents to follow on their route to school. Um, the other routes that my colleague spoke about, understand there are these routes um, to the east of the site. So there's a footpath that runs to the immediately to the east here. You can see it a bit clearer on the site. That connects into a series of other footpaths which run behind the houses on Rowan Close. That footpath goes from behind the back of the shops where the shared car park is, and that you can follow those routes up to the school as an alternative walking route. There are a number of routes through here. You can also walk along this way and round yes, that route may add slightly further time, but there are alternatives. There is also an alternative route here um, on this corner of the site. Thank you, Harways, anything to add? 
Um, yes, um, Councillor, it was really just to confirm what the case officer has just um, implement, um, sh illustrated on, on the screen. Yeah, the car park is a private car park and the footway um, just extends up to that corner and then it dog legs round. So it goes south of Rowan Drive and then it will um, head straight up on um, the footpath heading to the school. Is that answering your question in relation to parking and, and walking? Thank you. I'll go back to Councillor Kim. Uh, thank you, Chair. That's very clear to me. Can you give me an appropriate distance from that South Hill car park to the, to the school? Councillor O'Leary. Uh, Councillor Kimber sort of answered, uh, answered and asked my question. I was only going to ask for a map to show just how close the school was to the site and the route. So I haven't actually got a question. Thank you. Are there any other technical questions for officers? I now open the de the uh, uh, debate to members. Uh, do we have someone to speak? Yes, Councillor O'Leary. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I was on the uh, planning committee when this first came to planning, and I had concerns then around uh, access and around traffic. Um, and I really can't see any reason why uh, it should be changed. I don't see why we should have to subject the residents of these two roads to chaos and to although that i know understand and i thank them for putting certain things in place but i see no reason to change this at all um uh, councillor barrow mentioned the risk factor effect of four um i think that's a quite a risk as it is just to change it for the convenience of a developer when we had a plan in place um if that the plan that was already in place wasn't suitable then that's their fault for not putting it in in the first place so therefore, I will be voting against this change. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Leary. Councillor Weller. Thank you. Um, it, it's interesting that um, the residents, that all, all these mitigations are in place, you know, not, not using the road at school, dropping off, dropping on time and so on. And yet the residents are saying, um, that they are already inconvenienced, and we all know that the development has barely started. Um, like my my sort of local colleagues, I drive up and down there all the time, and I'm amazed at how little has been done yet. Um, if it's inconvenient now, what's it going to be like later on? Um, I don't have confidence um, that the wheel wash facility will be used every time, there'll be mud on the road, we all know that that happens. Um, I'm not convinced that um, the, the traffic marshals will always be there um, directing people, or that drivers in a hurry to get from one site to another are going to take any notice of that. I'm not convinced by any of these mitigation uh, situations. Also, we all know that children use, children don't look where they're going when they're going to school because they're talking to their chums. They're, a lot of them are on their phones these days. Um, but they use the shortest route to get to school. We see that by the, the, the impromptu paths across grass and everything else. So saying that this is the route that they ought to use and then they'll be perfectly safe. Well, I don't know about any of you, but I don't know any eight-year-old or nine-year-old is going to take any notice of, of me saying that to them. Um, so I'm a bit torn in that I'd like this development to be started, get it started, get it finished. And clearly, the quickest way of doing that would be to go along with what the developers want. But why should we? Radipole Lane is a nice, straight, lane with good visibility at that site, clearly that's where the, the truck should be going in and out. Um, and if you can't organise it, well, how well are you going to organise the, the mitigation situation? So 
um, I was on the original application and I can see no reason why we should be changing it. Um, but I do wish they'd get on with it. We do need those houses. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rack. Councillor Kimber. Uh, thank you, Chair. I also agree we badly need uh, these homes. I wish it was social housing, but it's affordable housing and um, that, that um, is a positive one. However, until I'm happy with the various factors around the traffic management, I don't think I can support this. I'm asking you to take this back and get our traffic departments to really look at this because I don't actually believe at the end of the day many people will park their cars and walk with their child 250, 300 yards to the school from the, from the car park. So therefore, Ch Chair, I will not be supporting this application but um, uh, ask you to take it back have a have a look at these traffic plans. Work with the, with that ward, with that community, and uh, bring it back until we, we we've actually got uh, what we call a credible plan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kimmer. Councillor O'Leary, if you can want to come back. Yeah, the only thing I'd like to add is I, I know that they put mitigations in for the times of leaving school, and that will you know help uh, during those rush hour times. But as a school governor myself and someone who represents two primary schools, um, not all young people leave at the same time of those, you know, people have dental appointments, they have uh, other appointments to go to. Um, some young people in, with uh, certain needs only do half day, so I can't, um, and I'd say they're the ones that would be more likely at risk in singular groups or singular units, and it is a, a group of young people leaving at rush hour, so I'm afraid um, that I think the risk on that is too great, and I see no reason not to respect the original application. Thank you, Councillor Kimber. Do we have any other speakers? Yeah. Councillor Ball. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, on a point of clarification, I, I, am I hearing that um, if this condition isn't varied, that the development itself is in danger of not taking place due to access reasons? Can I ask that, put that to the officer, please? Although this is a debate, I will allow that. That's correct. Right. It's gone off again. Yeah, um, I'm hearing the mitigation factors, which I was quite impressed with but I'm also concerned also about the safety of the children. Um, it's gonna be very, very difficult to um, ensure 100% and um, I'm sort of leaning to not approving this, but at the same time, I'm also concerned that the members are aware of the fact that it does sound as though this development will be in jeopardy and I think it's um, in balance for you to decide whether you want that to go ahead um, and whether the mitigation factors are gonna be uh, sufficient. Um, at the moment, I'm undecided, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to um, pick up on a few points that have arisen during the, the debate, if I may, and particularly um, a few times it's been referenced to um, the applicant seeking to change um, the access as previously agreed. And, and whilst I understand that concern being raised, I think it is important to, to come back to the fact that we need to consider this application before us um, and consider whether this, this proposed access is, is suitable um, and can be safely achieved. And as you've heard, our, our colleagues in, in the highways team are advising us that that, that can, be, um, can be achieved. And also, um, clearly, the, the construction management plan would be um, secured via planning condition. There are um, enforcement powers available to the local authority um, should that condition not be complied with. And we do have a dedicated enforcement team that, that does take, um, particularly where inquiries and concerns are raised in regard to public safety and highway safety, those are given high priority. So I just wanted to make those points if I could, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Right, do we have any other speakers? Now, one we're looking for a proposal of some form and a seconder. Thank you. 
right, I see. You, youth before, youth, yeah, I'm not going to say. Um, um, I'd like to propose a refusal on this uh, based on, uh, now this is where I'm going to struggle, is trying to find a reason. Uh, I'm going to say uh, safety concerns. I don't think I can get away with that. Though. Could you repeat your reasons for? I would like to recommend a refusal application based on concerns uh, around public safety. Chair, um, I would just like to be clear, really, with regards to what aspects of public safety members are referring to. Obviously, you've heard from your highway officers that there is no highway safety issue. Um, any certainly any limited impact is not severe. Therefore, in terms of the MPPF, we wouldn't be able to sustain a reason of refusal, is our view. Um, and when I talk about highway safety, I'm talking about highway safety in terms of vehicle movements and pedestrians. So we just need to be very clear, really, as to what that um, concern and reason is. Okay, thank you. Councillor Weller, would you like to come in? I don't know whether it helps to say that um, uh, Councillor O'Leary and I and anyone else who, who supports um, our proposal um, can see no reason in the current application to depart from the original approval. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing here overwhelmingly um, makes us feel that our decision last time was uh, should be changed. Uh, I don't know whether that helps with um, giving a reason for our, our refusal. Thank you. I'll go back and actually ask the question. Apologies, thank you. Um, I don't think, believe that that in itself would um, constitute a reasonable and defensible reason for refusal. Um, I appreciate the point, but as I mentioned earlier, applicants do have the right to apply for changes to um, existing conditions. So it'd be key to understand the concerns with the change proposed, I think, and the reasons for that being unacceptable. Councillor Kimber. Uh, thank you, Chair, if I can help. We're, we're not... In, when we say we're refusing this, we're refusing this on, on because we're concerned about public safety and the safety of the, um, the children going to school, where, where they report. What I was asking for, or perhaps I should be clearer, is to take this back for one cycle of meetings. I think all of us are very, quite happy about the planning application, the building, the need for housing in that area is only, is, I think all of us agree, but we're happy with that part. The only part we're not happy about is getting our young people to school. So I'm asking for if it could be taken back for one cycle, come back to us and have a, have a look at this. And so we can then make a formal judgment. Thank you. Of course, what we're doing, we're actually debating a particular application and, uh, and uh, um, asking for a deferral might be a completely different route to take. Councillor O'Leary. Someone else is on. Oh, thank you. I quite struggle to find why this has come to planning if the officers can find a reason to support the council's decision to recommend a refusal. It's like playing a game of bowling and somebody's glued all the pins to the floor. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm, I mean, I, I, I as a councillor, as an elected member, have stated I have concerns based on evidence from members of the public and the ward members. The ward member presented a, a risk assessment from the developer which stated the risk at four, which is possible, or likely or possible, likely, 
therefore I have concerns. I cannot in good faith or in good judgment uh, vote for this and approve this if I feel it's going to put young people at risk. I, I mean, I can't do that. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm a bit sketchy of, of uh, there seems to be sort of a, I don't really understand why this has come to us. There's no way of refusing it and it's a sort of a done deal. Can I ask advice, please? Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, clearly, it is um, within the remit of the committee to um, refuse the application if, that, if that's the decision you wish to take. Um, as officers, um, it's our, our role is to advise on whether or not proposed reasons for re refusal are likely to be um, defensible and robust um, in potential um, future appeal or challenge situation, and, and, and that's the kind of concerns we've raised with you. But I think we've given our advice and our officer's position on this application. I'm not sure there's much further we can add on that. Mary. May I refer to Steve for a comment, please? Thank you, Chair. First point of clarification, the level four and the risk assessment that uh, the councillors are referring to, that identified the risk and then proposed mitigation measures, which you will see in the traffic management plan. So it identified there could be a concern and they've overcome it by implementing the traffic management plan. That's the standard uh, safety audit procedure. Um, as a highway authority, as a statutory constituent in the planning system, when the first application came in, we had no objection to it. And that wasn't considering an alternative construction access, it was coming from Sycamore Road and Poplar Close. This application has come in, or the variation, we're consistently saying exactly the same thing. We do not feel that there are sufficient highway safety grounds here to be able to recommend a refusal for this application. This is the advice we're giving you as the highway authority. If you choose to disregard that advice, that's obviously your prerogative as a committee. We are saying that in terms of the MPPF and paragraph 110 and 111, we do not feel that the impact of this development and the construction access as, uh, as proposed here is severe. And we do not feel that there are justifiable or robust reasons to refuse it that will be sustainable in an appeal situation. Thank you, Chair. Councillor O'Leary, you want to come back? Am I on? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would, I can, like I said, I cannot vote for this. On the issue of an appeal, um, I would trust that the developer has stated that he's interested and listened to the views of the community and of, uh, and of uh, the elected members of that area, that he would um, respect the decision made at this um, committee and not appeal the decision. Um, I mean, that's what I would... Uh, expect him to do but I mean I'm, I'm prepared I'm not prepared to uh, vote for this um, I'm not sure if there's any other um, proposals going forward if not um, uh, then yeah well okay uh, I'm now going to ask Councillor Worth to come in please um, I, I, I'm sorry uh, thank you chairman yeah um, I sit here and listen to the debate and the um, evidence that's um, been put forward by our planning officers and our highways and backed up by development manager leads me to believe that if this goes to appeal, we're almost certain to lose because of the, the we can't come up with a valid planning reason for refusing this application we're we're struggling as members to come up with a valid reason if we cannot come up with any valid planning reason and the officers recommendations and the highways authorities recommendations are opposed to our view that if we wanted to refuse it then i think we're on very difficult ground um, and i can understand emotions coming into it um, with regard to um, wanting to refuse it, but if we cannot come up with a valid planning reason, then I see little point in this committee voting to refuse this. Thank you. Unusually, I'm going to actually ask uh, one of the speakers to come in who's expressed a, a, a desire to make a comment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in an effort to help members, really, um, one of the things that you've got to consider is that there are alternatives for the developer. They just cost more money. So whilst I accept Highway's uh, considered decision, there's something wrong with the process 
where the developer says it's highly likely for that there could be an accident and our own highways department saying there is no risk. Is there something wrong with that? So my advice is disregard what highways are saying because the developer themselves says that it's highly likely. But this is about money. So in voting for this, you could vote to refuse and ask the developer to go away and come up with an alternative that is safer. Thank you. Thank you for allowing that's okay, Gray. I'm Councillor Gray. Uh, yes, remembering, of course, we are, we've got a proposal before us which we're debating, and really that is the only thing that we're, we're concerned about, whether we support it or not. Councillor Kim. Um, Chair, fellow councillors, uh, officers, I still stand by, and it's clear, clear that we have not got a, 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 a logical planning reason to refuse this. I still stand by that the that we should defer this to, to allow the officers to re, really look at what has been suggested look at those routes look at those plans look at the safety indications that councillors and the public have raised and uh, and then we bring it back thank you thank you uh, uh, councillor kim but remembering of course as i've just said it is a, it is a proposal before us we are we are debating this particular propo proposal if that proposal doesn't actually uh, suit them, these, then I suggest you know that um, you, you you should uh, think alternative um, 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 response. But but uh, but you know we have what we got before us. Councillor Leary, Chairman, as I as I feel uh, the uh, applicant will, after some good encouragement, uh, appeal the decision if refused. Um, I therefore will. Um, with Councillor Weller's agreement, um, withdraw my uh, proposal for refusal and second Councillor Kimber um, in his proposal for a deferment. Councillor Bowell. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, I'm still struggling with this one in, on, on a few fronts. Um, I'm still coming back to the fact that this development sounds as though it's in, in jeopardy. Um, and I have to trust that the officers have done their, their work um, professionally. Um, if there's no alternative, then obviously I don't really want to vote against this. However, I understand what my fellow councillors are saying and uh, the, the motion that may be put before us shortly, that um, there could be alternatives. Um, I'm not happy with the safety issue, although I do understand that the, uh, the level four has now produced mitigating uh, a traffic plan which should actually get rid of that risk. So I don't want to lose sight of that because I, I'm, I'm tempted to vote for this, but I, I do understand the concerns of, of, of my fellow councillors here. And um, I wouldn't vote for the motion that was put forward just now. I would be tempted to um, consider a deferment then. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bower. Can I... Um... Oh, oh. It's a point of order, I suppose. Could I have some clarity in not just on this particular case, but generally on planning committee? If a proposition is put before the committee which no one feels they are able to support, yet no one can put puts forward a proposal to reject, what happens? It's up to the committee who, who goes against the officer's recommendation to come up with a form of words which, which will stand up in, in uh, uh, planning terms uh, and, and go forward as, as, the, as the rejection. So it's, it's up to the planning committee to actually come up with a form of words which satisfies the, uh, the, the planning conditions. If no one feels able to support, but no one on the committee comes forward with a proposal to object, we're left in with stalemate. I'm just wondering what the procedure is. Could I have some ask for some advice, please? Um, I'm not sure personally. I don't know if, if legal, if our legal representative would have any advice on that, or we could. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can find out. If carry on with the meeting. Um. I think it would help 
um, councillors, if we, if we focus on the, um, the, what the MPPF says, um, and this was highlighted by uh, our colleague from Highways, that development should only be prevented or refused on highway grounds if there would be an unacceptable impact on highway safety or the residual cumulative impacts on the road network would be severe. So I know I'm not answering the, that question because I, I need to look that up. <laughs> but your advice from your officers here today is that there is an impact on highway safety. That is why they are recommending, that, or that they did recommend, that there was a condition to put forward this management plan. Their advice to you is that the management plan that has been submitted removes um, risk to a level that there is that, that it is an acceptable impact on highway safety. And of course, as we're only dealing with construction traffic, it's also a, a temporary impact. If the councillors um, disagree, then that, that, that would be a reason for moving forward for a refusal that you believe that the the plan submitted and the advice of the officers is does, does mean that there is an unacceptable impact on highway safety during the period of construction. And I will have to look up the, <laughs> the other answer to that question. <laughs> Councillor O'Leary, I understand that you may wish to speak. Um, it's my understanding we have a proposal on the table uh, by, uh, for, uh, proposed by Councillor Kimber, seconded by myself, uh, to recommend a deferment. Um, I would actually move that we go to a vote on that, um, if that's correct. I'm not quite sure whether that's an option. Chair. I think members would be entitled to go for a deferral unless legal advice otherwise. But again, I just want to be really clear about why we'd be deferring it and what you'd be expecting to happen in the meantime. Because I just want to reassure members really that you know the situation has been explored by the planning officer and the highway safety and all the um, information that's been submitted is considered. You know, the planning officer has read all the representations that have been submitted. So it's just to understand what members are seeking to achieve from a deferral. Yes, O'Leary. Yes, thank you. While we can, um, uh, while we have concerns over highway safety and the highways officers don't agree with that, I think it's better to say that we are not uh, fully content uh, with the level of information on this in terms of the safety aspect. Therefore, we would like to seek uh, further information and also look at alternatives to this proposal. Um, yes. Uh, that's what I was. Um, it, it, that was very helpful. Um, I think for the future, it would be very useful for all planning committee members to know what would happen if, for example, we all abstained on something. Um, there would be no; it would be a stalemate, and it would be a, it's um, it's academic maybe, um, but it would be a useful thing to know for the future. Coming back to to, to today, I think what we are asking from a deferral is to be provided with a greater degree of confidence that the management program will be very, very carefully monitored so that if residents are trapped in their homes, unable to get their cars off their drives, and it's late on Friday night, that doesn't mean they can't get out until Monday morning when the building um, team come back in. So what we're asking from um, our planning and our highways teams 
is a more robust uh, plan, a more regulated plan, a plan that we can have a greater confidence in. And I personally would like to, to say that I am still unhappy with how safe our children might be. And although I accept that this is a temporary thing, that there isn't going to be construction um, traffic there forever, but during the time that it is, I want to feel that I've done everything I can to keep children safe, because I personally won't be able to um, live with the idea, well, it was only temporary, and it's a shame that little boy, that little girl was seriously injured. Um, so I want a greater degree of confidence in the management plan. Um, and I don't know whether that will help you in, in um, knowing what we're asking from a deferral. Uh, and I think it's a shame that we need to do this because I, again, wish they'd get on and do it. Finally, I'm going to call on uh, the, our acting vice chairman, Councillor Dempsey, who would like to say a few words. Then I will bring this to a conclusion. Thank you, Chairman. It's been very interesting listening to this, no matter how we've come to this, come into this meeting with our thoughts today. It has been very interesting. And I would just like to reiterate that it is up to officers to advise and lead us down the correct route as regards legalities. And it is up to us to decide, each one of us elected councillors, to make the decision. And that's what we're charged with doing this morning, whatever it should be. I personally, think deferral would be a good idea because this seems to be going on and on and on and we're, we're just sort of getting a pushback almost and if if it were deferred and came back to us we would have more grounds and i think our ground would be firmer to make our our thoughts count and to make our decision thank you chairman Thank you, Councillor Tansi. Chairman, could this gentleman? I will allow it. Thank you. I know this is unprecedented in many ways. I think the residents pretty much would agree to a deferral. Um, one request I would make is can the developer bring down the largest piece of equipment that he intends to get on site? and physically demonstrate to you, the councillors, how they're going to marshal that safely onto site with the existing traffic on that road. Thank you very much. Councillor O'Leary. Ch Chairman, just a point of order, um, we've heard from both the ward councillors again and Mr. Dixon, shouldn't we for fairness and fair play uh, and to get an even playing field, let the gentleman, um, the other gentleman speak, um, just, just so we get a level balanced on this one. Oh, I, I was batting for you. <laughs> Of course, in, in, in deferring, of course, it, uh, it only gives the officers the opportunity of, uh, of looking again at the routes that they've already suggested, not to find alternative routes. Uh, uh, they are obviously have gone into, into great depth as to which are the best routes available. And, uh, and by deferring that, you know, they, they, uh, we're not saying, oh, go and find something better. Um, what we're saying is, you know, I suppose, is give people a little bit of time in order to, to, to actually think about alternatives. Councillor Wynne. Councillor Wynne. 
Thank you, Chair. I, was, um, I agree with deferral, but along with that deferral, could we please have a site visit with an officer? Um, and therefore, we will look, be able to understand this application more. That would, be, that would be quite interesting, bearing in mind, of course, we've already had a site visit to this particular application. I, I can't remember. No, 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 no. Remember meeting in the cafe in the, in the car park behind with all the shops and we were all looking around when it first came up for a proposal. There's a cafe there, chair. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just to say, um, in regard to the site visit request, we would need um, the reasons for that recorded in the minutes, along with any specific viewpoints that members would wish to view the site from. Councillor Weller. I think the, the reason for a site visit would be that, um, al although you, we have a, a number of people uh, on the committee who do come from Weymouth or Portland and therefore know the site quite well, there are members who come from quite different areas of the, of, of the region and are not so familiar. Um, it would be useful for them to see the lie of the land, as it were, um, but also um, to get a better understanding of the, uh, the intricacies of uh, bringing heavy building vehicles down what are actually quite um, confined uh, residential estate roads. So, so it, it, again, it comes back to what I said earlier, give us a better degree of confidence that we, that we are uh, caring for the safety of, of our residents and our young people. Thanks, Councillor Weller. I believe uh, uh, Councillor Dancy wishes to come back. Thank you, Chairman. I think the idea of a site visit, when we're considering children's lives, is very appropriate. And maybe it's time for us to walk the walk. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, we've got... Oh, Councillor yeah, Williams. Um, Councillor Don Seifers just said what I was going to say. I mean, a very important part of this site visit would be actually to walk through alternative school routes um, and, and see the time they take, etc. Because, as Councillor Weller says, several of us are not familiar with this area. And uh, so I, I hope that was a good enough reason for us to defer on the site visit. <clears throat> right, uh, uh, committee, gentlemen, and what have you, I think we're going to conclude this now. I think I'll, uh, we've got a proposal and a seconder to defer. Yeah. I, subject to a site, and then, then uh, 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 a proposal for a site visit. Councillor Kimber. Oops. and uh, that, that we we defer this and we subject to a site visit and so so we can get it i think councillors will be quite uh, this will be quite useful given the uh, terrain at uh, that particular area we have a proposal and a second to for a deferral to defer this item uh, and then subject it to the site visit to bring back at a future occasion. Is that okay? All those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, uh, yeah, you may wish to go back into the auditorium. And, uh, and uh, we are actually, I have a feeling, I'm going to go for a 
a, br a comfort break now. And that gives me have a chance to, uh, to have a chat with uh, the officers and, um, and uh, carry on from there. Thank you very much for your indulgence and thank you for your contribution, everyone. Chair, ten minutes. Chair, ten minutes. Ten minutes, everyone. Thank you.
we start? Can we start? Can I bring the meeting to order, please? Uh, we're now going to take on uh, item 5C on the agenda, and that is land west of Wharton Lane, Bridport. And that's for the erection of three dwellings. Now, may I ask uh, Dr Mandy Powell, Rachel uh, Gersfield, uh, Phil Semerton, all public speaker, speakers, Simon Ludgate, the agent, and councillors Paul Hartman and Dave Bowell, please take their seats uh, at the front here. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. Right. Right, committee, um, I now invite Thomas Wilde, case, the case officer, to introduce this item. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I just share my screen, um, bear with me a second. Okay, um, this is planning application P slash FUL 2021-01762 for land less west of Watton Lane, Bridport. Uh, the proposal is for the erection of three dwellings. Um, this slide shows the site location, um, the site being to the west of Watton Lane, which is shown um, here, and um, Broad Lane to the north of the, uh, to the north. Um, we sh next slide shows uh, an aerial photograph of the site. Um, this is slightly dated um, because um, planning permission has previously been granted for a construction of a single dwelling on the land that looks appears to be kind of cut out from the site in this northeastern corner. Um, the um, that that uh, that that planning permission has been implemented and the dwelling has been constructed on the site. Uh, planning history for the site, um, working backwards, um, most recently is for the um, dwelling in the northeastern corner of, of the site, which was as an alternative to a previously approved scheme. Um, the approval of reserve matters for um, that dwelling um, pre um, prior to the, the, the alternative scheme. Um, on the application site itself, um, in uh, 2020, um, planning permission was granted on appeal for the erection of two dwellings on the site um, following a refusal at local level and 2018 um, outline application for the erection of one dwelling which is in the northeastern corner again. Um, moving on to a photograph of the site, this is standing centrally in the site looking southwards. You can see West Bay in the distance. Um, there's some building materials and things that have been deposited on the site uh, and this, this shows how the land levels on the site um, fall away towards the south um, and at first quite gradually and then they, they drop away more steeply the further to the south they go. Um, this is from the same vantage point looking northwards um, so you can see that there are dwellings immediately to the north. Uh, we have single-story bungalows immediately to the north and then to the north east, uh, sorry, northwest of the site, uh, two-story dwellings. This is looking northwest from a, a vantage point slightly further north in the site. Um, you can see some of the, the boundary treatments with the um, dwellings to the northwest. And these, this is one of the dwellings immediately to the north. You can see um, primarily have a sub southerly aspect um, and they're single-storey dwellings immediately to the north of the site. Um, this photo is of the recently constructed dwelling in the, to the northeastern corner of the site. Again, um, one storey in scale, there, there is accommodation in the roof space of that dwelling, though. 
and this is looking southwards for the northern end of the site. Um, you can see this is the garage to the recently constructed dwelling um, and an access road um, partially constructed through and then some of the building materials that have been stored on the site at that time. This is the proposed site layout plan. Um, oh, gone too fast forward. Um, so this, this site layout plan, plot one, as shown on, on the plan here, is actually the, the plot that has already been constructed, with plots two, three, and four being the subject of this planning application. Plot two is a single-story dwelling, and um, plots three and four are two-story, four-bedroom dwellings. Um, starting with plot two, um, it's a it's a T-shaped bungalow layout three, with three bedrooms and living and dining space. Um, we're showing solar panels on the southern elevation um, and there's some roof lights um, with a vaulted ceiling to the dining room area. Plots three um, is a four bedroom, oh, four bedroom dwelling. Um, we have a kitchen and dining room, living room with a detached double garage and four double bedrooms upstairs. These are the elevations for plot three. You can see um, a relatively um, simple suburban design dwelling with a hip roof um, is proposed. Um, plot four is essentially a handed version of the same um, overall design. Um, once again, we have kitchen, living and dining rooms downstairs with a study utility, double garage and four double bedrooms on the first floor. Um, and in this instance, the, um, the garage is linked to the dwelling with a covered walkway, uh, which you can see in this east and west elevation here. Um, but as you can see, the, the overall design of the dwelling is broadly the same as for plot three. Um, the main issues identified um, are principle of development. So the site is located outside of the defined development boundary of Bridport. Um, however, balanced against this, the presumption in favour of sustainable development applies due to the council's housing and supply position. Um, and we have the extant planning consent on site for two dwellings, um, which was granted at appeal um, and which can still be implemented. And that is a material consideration to which weight has been afforded in, in making the recommendation. Uh, we have landscape and visual impact. The site is, is located within the Dorset AOMB, as is all of Bridport. Um, it's, however, lo located on an urban fringe location, um, and therefore any of the development would be viewed in the context of that urban fringe. Um, and the scale is such that the, um, the scale has been sought to limit the impacts of the development by locating the larger scale buildings to the um, lower, geographically lower parts of the site um, and the density of development while higher than previously approved would still remain relatively low. Um, in design and character terms, the layout and pattern is similar to the immediate surroundings. Um, it's more formalised than previously approved but uh, that's not considered to be um, an inappropriate design approach um, and it is considered that the design is, is appropriate in the context. In respect of amenity, um, the de development would achieve significant separation distances to neighbouring properties um, and the falling land levels towards the south would help to mitigate any potential for overbearing or loss of light um, to, to, the, to the extent where they, those wouldn't be um, considered to be sufficient to uh, justify a refusal and so it's not considered that there would be harm to amenity. Um, in respect of biodiversity, there has been a biodiversity survey provided which concludes that there's negligible potential for protected species on the sites um, and recommendations are made for mitigation and enhancement measures which are to be secured by condition. Um, in respect of trees, there are no trees on the site um, and hedgerows are confined to the boundaries. Um, it's, well, the, the tree officer did, did note that there was no tree survey provided um, this wasn't raised as a, as a con concern or constraint in previous planning applications and grants of planning permission on the site, so it wasn't considered um, necessary or reasonable to require that additional information at this stage. Um, and in respect of flood risk and drainage, the site is located within flood zone one, so it's not therefore in a location which is identified as being at risk of flooding. Um, and 
um, concern has been raised in um, third party comments in respect to foul drainage connections uh, and the potential for those to impact upon boundary um, hedging, but the foul drainage connections um, have already actually been made in respect of the um, development that's already been implemented and completed on the site and connections would be into that existing infrastructure. Therefore, um, the recommendation is that the committee grants planning permission subject to the recommended conditions as listed in the report, which are the three-year time limit, the approved plans condition, um, details of materials to be agreed, um, details of finished floor levels to be agreed, biodiversity mitigation to be agreed, um, details of means of enclosure and boundary walls and fences, um, the first five metres of the access to be constructed prior to occupation, which is at the request of the highways authority, access and turning parking, access, turning and parking areas to be provided prior to occupation, and the provision and maintenance of visibility displays at the, en en at the access. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Oh, it's Sorry, Chair, it's just been pointed out to me, um, the, the update sheet was circulated. Um, the visibility space condition has been updated um, to reflect um, the correct references to appropriate legislation um, and permitted amendment with a general permitted amendment order. So the recommendation is subject to the, the amendments set out in the update sheet. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, I would li like to invite Dr. Mandy Powell to address the committee. Please speak directly into the microphone, and you have three minutes. Over to you, uh, uh, Dr. Powell. Well. No, that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am speaking on behalf of Foxgloves, which is one of the bungalows that you saw uh, in um, one of the case officer's slides there. So uh, I actually live immediately uh, on the boundary of this proposed site. Firstly, the marginal shortfall in the five-year housing supply does not justify the additional erosion to an AOMB this application will bring and it cannot be justified on the basis of public interest. The declared principle of development also relies on the extant application for two dwellings approved by the planning inspector. The planning inspector's report was written before the first dwelling was started and assumes that dwelling would be single storey and below Foxgloves' roof line. Furthermore, the inspector observes that the additional two dwellings would be situated in staggered and informal relation to the first. Crucially, the inspector writes, the development hereby approved shall in all respects accord strictly with the drawings of the location plan, site plan, and section submitted in September and October 2019. It cannot be assumed, therefore, that the planning inspector would approve a new appeal given the significant change a third dwelling will make to the design of the development. Secondly, the case officer's assertion that an additional unit will not cause significant harm to neighbouring amenity is palpably false. The as-built two-storey dwelling constructed in breach of the original conditions granted by this council has brought with it five vehicles that use the access road running three metres closer to Foxgloves than originally approved. Foxgloves is now bounded by roads on three sites. Just one house has brought lights, noise, vehicular pollution and continuous visual disturbance to the landscape where we used to have stillness, quiet and darker skies. It is never just one house. All our rear rooms are overlooked by vehicles using that access road. Lights shine into our windows. We no longer sit in our back garden. Our way of life has been devastated by this one house. The harm to my mother in particular is immeasurable. She is frequently in tears. She used to enjoy sitting, gazing out at her garden. Now she sits with her back to it. Thirdly, this development will draw attention to itself from the cliff path. Foxgloves is dwarfed by the first dwelling and is not what the planning inspector imagined. 
this new arrangement of houses will not be screened by mature trees. This development, with its bright colours and its black tarmac access road scarring the hillside, will be out of kilter. To conclude, if you approve the addition of just one more house, you will be approving the creation of a suburban development visibly bisected by a road in an AOMB. You will approve a landscape out of kilter with Bridport's fragile rural, rural peripheries. Our right to privacy and our way of life has been materially eroded by just one unit. Please do not undermine and dismiss us by attempting to negate the very real and evident impacts of just one more house. Originally, you approved the construction of only a single one-story bungalow. You objected to the application to build a further two dwellings when it was received shortly thereafter. You must, therefore, reject this application for a further three. There is a moral argument to be made about duty of care. Please do not allow any further detriments to our way of life or to our landscapes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Powell. I now invite Rachel uh, Gershfield to address the committee. Rachel, you have uh, three minutes. Right. I'm the resident of the Croft, which is a bungalow which overlooks this field. A very unfortunate resident at the present time. <clears throat> I have um, had supporting me um, a, pl a planning consultant called Andy Anderson. He's written very comprehensive reports to support what I'm going to say. And I do hope that some of you have read or will read these reports because they contain some very relevant information. I attended the planning meeting in December 2019 to discuss the application of the two properties. I was concerned about the possibility of building in an area of outstanding natural beauty and couldn't believe that it could be allowed, which of course it wasn't on the day as the planning committee turned it down. The field in question has been described as a piece of uncut grassland, but it was much more than that and had been used for years for grazing for horses and sheep, and was in fact the only last open space along that bit of coast with magnificent views up and down from West Bay. I was also concerned about the impact on my property, particularly privacy. All my rooms were built to face the sun, they face south and they face the field. My back garden was not very deep, about 25 to 30 feet, so I'm very clear, very close to my boundary. How right I was to be so concerned about my privacy. It was all proved much worse than I possibly could have imagined. My privacy has been totally evaded and it's been absolutely awful and I've had to look out on the field, which is a total mess with all the equipment left there for over a year. The consent for the first property, which is already built, was single story. It became a two story without consent originally. And so I'm now overlooked by the window from the first floor of this particular building. The house at the present time has five vehicles parked there, which can be seen clearly from my house and my garden. The lights outside the garage seem to be on all night. I don't know why, and I'm disturbed by the light pollution. And this is only for the first house. The thought of three properties with perhaps 20 vehicles and all the noise and light pollution appalls me. Two would be bad enough, but three would be much more. The pleasure I had from my house and garden has been severely diminished. I think, I think that it's very important indeed to give very careful to this consideration, because I believe that if it were granted, there would be subsequences which we would not be happy about. This is the third application for housing, first one for one house, the second for two, and the third for three. The planned road, which is going to run down the middle of the field, ends in front of a piece of spare land. I think it would be naive to think that this would remain like that for some time. 
based on our experience, and if this plan, if this property was agreed, I think that there would no doubt be a fourth planning application for more houses. And then what? A complete housing estate built in an area of outstanding natural beauty, almost by default, and ignoring the guidance given, given if building is allowed on an area of outstanding natural beauty. This was refused by the committee, by the planning committee, but then approved by the planning officer. The plan he approved was for just two properties to be staggered and to present a degree of informality. The proposal for three properties is that of a cul-de-sac of suburban type and layout and uniform rows. This does not support the staggering and informal layout commented on by the inspector and to which he gave such weight. I would ask that this application be refused. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, I now invite Phil Somerton to address the committee. You have three minutes. In favor of sustainable development. Um, first of all, the five-year housing land supply stated at 4.97 years, 0 0.03 of a year short of a critical five-year target. Can you be certain that this figure has been accurately calculated using the most up-to-date information? How has it been checked? The latest report I could find on the Dorset five-year, the West Dorset five-year housing land supply was for April 2020, published in March 2021. This report includes 80 dwellings deliverable by 2025 in relation to reverse farm development. The developers have said that they expect, with their detailed plans, to build nearly 500 houses by 2025. This, if it's correct, and it appears to be correct, will take the five-year supply well over the five years target. So how can we trust the 4.97 years figure? Secondly, while West Dorset has this tiny shortfall, East Dorset has more than a uh, five-year supply, 5.36 years. Given Dorset Council is now a uh, unitary council, surely you should calculate the figure for five years housing land supply over the whole of the county. The third point I want to raise is in relation to the judgment in the 2018 Hallam Land Court of Appeal case, in which the following statement was made by the judge where a local planning authority is unable to demonstrate a five years housing supply of land, the policy leaves to the decision makers planning judgment the weight to give to restrictive policies. Logically, however, one would expect the weight to be given such policies to be less if the shortfall is large and a lot more if the shortfall is small. In this case, we have a shortfall which is vanishingly small if it exists at all. And based on this judgment, must, more weight must be given to the policies that restrict the developers on the AO and B land. I also want to raise the issue around um, the meeting that was held in December 2019 to approve the two properties previously, uh, refuse the application of two properties by eight to one majority. I know a number of the members of the committee are present today, and I trust that they will also oppose this uh, application. One of the reasons for refusal was that the development was not sustainable, as the occupiers of the dwellings would be reliant upon their cars for day-to-day -day living requirements. There is no suitable or safe pedestrian route for the occupiers into Bridport. Broad Lane, as noted at the 2019 application, has no pavements, no lighting, is narrow, has blind bends and a large amount of overhanging trees. Residents from this development would have to walk well over half a kilometre to get to the first pavement into Bridport. I showed the committee a photograph of a road at the time. I'm disappointed that in the case officer's presentation, we didn't see a picture of Broad Lane to show you just how poor it is. I have a picture here which I could hand round, but I'm not allowed to hand round to you. So hopefully I'll leave it to your imagination to picture what it looks like. I find it really hard to understand how the planning spec formed a conclusion that the route down Broad Lane was for pedestrians a convenient and safe route. This is dangerous nonsense. And if followed, we'll put pedestrians' lives at risk. Particularly, you're going to have a lot more traffic coming from the Broad Lane, uh, from the Foundry Lee development going through Broad Lane to avoid traffic jams on the A35 near West Road. The reality is that residents will be forced to use cars, which is hardly in keeping with the climate change emergency that's been declared. 
and is not a proactive approach to mitigating climate change. If there are clear grounds for refusing this application, please do the right thing and refuse it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Phil. Right, I now I invite uh, Simon Ludgate to address the committee. Uh, Simon, you've got uh, three minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this site has the benefit of planning permission in outline for two dwellings. One has already been built, two further can be built. The planning inspector looked very closely at the uh, refused application for two and concluded that the site was surrounded by other development, that the shortfall in housing with the council was less than five years, and so therefore was a material consideration, and that the impact of this development in terms of access would be limited, and he walked the, um, the road network to ascertain that he felt it would be safe for people to use it. So he, he concluded that two further dwellings, additional to the one that's been constructed, would be acceptable. We're now asking for one more dwelling on top of that. And I would consider that the impact of that additional dwelling on top of what's already been approved would be minimal. Um, could I ask if the um, site location plan could be put up on the screen? <coughs> Uh, that'll do. Um, basically, if you look to the left-hand side of the site, to the west, there's a, product, um, a property called Little Paddock. Planning permission has been granted between that property and our site for development in recent years, and that is capable of being implemented. So if you look at the surrounding development of this area, this enclave is clearly open to development. Now, yes, we're spreading Bridport out further. Just over the hill, there's Veers Farm. There's gonna be 800 houses facing the other way. We're asking for an additional one here. And I fail to see that it would be possible to demonstrate to another <coughs> inspector that that additional one house would be materially detrimental to this area of outstanding natural beauty. Chairman, this is a sympathetic application that's been designed using the slope, slope of the site to minimize the development. It's a minimal development in terms of traffic generation. It's a minimal development in terms of volume. I would commend this application to you as being supportable um, and sustainable and within policy for this area. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I'm now going to invite Councillor Paul Hartman uh, of, uh, of um, uh, Simonsbury Parish Council to address the committee. Good afternoon, Chair, members and officers. My name is Paul Hartman, uh, Simonsbury Parish Councillor, and today I'm representing the views of that Parish Council. Notwithstanding the planning report submitted by the Parish Council, I wish to uh, sh show you the following key points that the main Parish Council asked me to reinforce to you. Simmonsbury Parish Council objected to the previous application for two dwellings, which was refused by the council and then overturned by appeal. The decision of no objection made by the Parish Council on the recent submission for three dwellings should not be considered as an approval for the proposal. The council had a split decision and in those instances, the chair made the decision. This can be referenced by the detailed planning report submitted by the Parish Council following that planning meeting. Much is referenced regarding the housing supply numbers as we've heard today. However, under SUS2, actually there's hardly any 
uh, divergence. And I would su suggest that there is more housing in the supply pipeline. It is clear the proposed development for three new dwellings, in addition to the single dwelling already constructed, are a more formal layout. It's noted by the inspector that he recommended the informal layout on the previous one. Also, it's, more, it's denser. The actual development is denser than the established dwelling plots in the immediate environment. This is out of keeping with the immediate environment locally and has a detrimental effect on the setting within the ANOB. The form of development is really piecemeal and opportunistic and most likely will lead to additional applications, as we've heard previously, on the remaining adjacent plot. Contrary to the comment in the planning officer's report, the parish council considers that the application does not conform with the Bridport area neighborhood plan and specifically, and specifically policies L1, L2, L4, brackets two and D1. The proposals form a denser urban settlement which degrade the existing available green space which characterizes the links between Simsbury and Bridport and the other parishes generally. That's a very important note. These green links are very important coming from a rural uh, parish into, into Bridport. This adds to a coalescence of development in the green spaces that are vitally important to all, not just the local residents. In terms of the environmental nature of the site, there's little mention of how positive biodiversity gain can be achieved. Leading from this, it is understood that during the initial work, engineering works were carried out on areas identified as unimproved agricultural land to the south of this site but within the same land holding. These works have compromised any biodiversity in that area and uh, that needs to be looked at in careful detail by this committee. In summary, the Parish Council had a split decision when considering this application and wish the committee to carefully consider this proposal in the light of the pressures on the quality of the ANOB <coughs> and the green open space linking the areas. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And finally, I call on um, um, Councillor uh, Dave Bowell, who's the ward member, to address the committee. Dave, you've got three minutes. And I apologize for the sound. Thank you, Chair. Um, the danger of going last is that everybody else steals your thunder. Um, as this current application for three houses makes reference to the inspector's previous decision, and our planning officer refers to the extant planning permission for two houses to which is attached great weight as a fallback position, then I'd like to look at this in greater detail. The fallback position for two houses seems to imply <laughs> so everyone's wondering where he's going out the door. Uh, it seems to imply that um, lost my place. some kind of justification for positively viewing this new application. But in his previous judgment, the inspector stated that the staggered arrangement proposed would result in a degree of informality that would be in keeping with the character and appearance of Watton. This new application changes the arrangement to one of uniformity in the AONB. That would be clearly visible and this application has to be viewed on its own merits. I do not believe it is correct to assume that the inspector would have reached the same decision on this new application as he did on the previous one for two. The inspector also stated when allowing the appeal for two dwellings, given the nature, scale and location of the proposal, the impacts of the development are unlikely to be significant for the two. It's worth considering the question at what stage the number of dwellings and scale, this piecemeal development would become significant. Again, this cannot be assumed. The planning inspector previously concluded that the site was sustainable and the occupiers could walk or cycle to the facilities in Bridport and would not need the use of a car. There are apparently footpaths close by that could be used for walking into Bridport. I have walked them. A, <laughs> a diversion bordering on half a mile from the site, then across three muddy fields and a dangerous rickety wooden style. In no way is this a suitable route to access facilities other than to enjoy the countryside or walk your dog. And as for the road, as it's already been stated, 
He'll be a very brave person indeed who would choose to walk for half a mile to Morrison's along a stretch of narrow road, no pavement or lighting, and up a steep hill on the return journey while carrying the week's shopping. The inspector stated there was good visibility in passing places for two cars, but unfortunately he didn't advise where the pedestrians were supposed to seek refuge when meeting one car, let alone two trying to pass each other. It's not a safe route for pedestrians, especially children, regardless of his decision. There isn't any public transport to Watton. There aren't any nearby bus stops. Report Tang Centre is a good mile away from the site. These proposed houses have two parking spaces and garages. To me, this would clearly indicate that the use of cars is accepted, expected, and required to be commercially viable. If you look closely at the plan, and I wish it was still up there, you will also see that if granted, this site would develop half of the field in a uniform mini estate. There is still half a field to go. The applicant states that there would be a gate into the field that would be kept locked. Is this implying no more development? I realize that this, is, that this could be considered as not a material planning matter, but piecemeal development should not be allowed. Have you got the one showing the four houses, please, Thomas, that'd be helpful. Thank you. As you can see, the, the field is to the right, so there's a, at least the same amount of land again. And the road, when you on a different plan, looks as though it's a cul-de-sac, it's actually where the gate's going. Finally, I ask that you should consider the overarching definition given by the NPPF of sustainable de development being summarized as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This proposed development consists of open market, detached three or four bedroom houses requiring the use of cars as there are no adequate safe alternatives and these simply do not meet the housing needs of the present generation. In Bridport, or the climate emergency. Our planning officer has highlighted that there is already a fallback position of, previously approval, of previous approval for two houses given by the planning inspector. I say so be it. This site should not be developed any further than that already approved. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. And the noise seems to have ceased, which was good. Um, I, I call on Thomas Wall to respond with any salient points he may wish to clarify. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to, there's a couple of points that I wanted to, to come back on. Um, firstly, in respect of the housing land supply position. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, in respect of the housing land supply position, um, some, some comments were made in respect of the uh, position for East Dorset um, and whether that should make um, lead to a conclusion that the council does have a housing land supply uh, for the area. At present, the position is that we do not, um, and we consider housing land supply on the basis of the plan area. So the, the land supply, housing land supply that we are uh, calculation that we are basing this on is for the West Dorset, Weymouth and Portland local plan um, area. Um, as I say, at, at present, the, the position is that we do not have a, a supply. Um, in respect of the layout, um, some comments have been made um, just to uh, around the, the um, layout of the previous scheme. I thought it might be helpful just to show that just for some context um, for, for those members who might not have been um, uh, part of the previous application. So this is the approved lay outline scheme um, with the, 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 the area in hatched in blue here which is where the, the dwelling has been constructed and this is the, the two, two unit scheme. Um, as an outline application, only the access and layout was considered at that point. So there was no indication of the scale of the dwellings or, um, or, the, or their detailed design approved. Um, and I would also point out that there, there's, the, while there was reference to the informal layout of the uh, scheme in the inspector's decision, they, the, the inspector was considering this scheme specifically um, rather than that being necessarily the, the appropriate approach. Um, he was saying that the, the layout was, was appropriate. 
Um, and finally, just in terms of the density of development to, to give some context, um, the site area is just over half a hectare when, when considering the whole um, area which is given over to the what would be the four, four units which would result in a, a development density of approximately eight dwellings per hectare versus six dwellings per hectare when, when the um, fallback position is taken into consideration. Thank you, Chair. Are there any questions of a technical nature, nature for the case officer? Please. Councillor Kimber. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this area is an ANOB and also outside the development boundary. When does that stand in any significance when we judge future planning applications or does it does that hold any scope as to why we should develop it with those two protections thank you um, thank you chair um, we do have policies um, sus2 principally which directs development to in the first instance to the land within development boundaries um, and within the area of outstanding natural beauty um, we do have policies for the protection of the landscape um, however that those policies need, do need to be balanced against the other material considerations that are relevant in this case uh, which include the housing land supply position and which has triggered the presumption in favour of sustainable development as set out in the National Planning Policy Framework um, and also the pr pr planning history and the previous planning consent which, which as I've set out in my report does establish a material fallback position to which weight um, has been afforded in, in, the, in making the recommendation. Are there any other questions of a technical nature? Sarah Williams. Thank you. Yeah, you, I mean, when you finished your previous summary and you mentioned the eight houses per hectare, what size houses? Was there any mention of size of houses? Because these are two four bedroom houses, uh, two four bedroom houses and one three bedroom house with one three bedroom house already on the site. So the calculation of dwellings per hectare is, is a simplistic one which just considers the number of houses. It doesn't consider the size of the houses. It's, it's simply saying the site is X hectares and there are this many dwellings on it. Um, so it, at, at, at 0.5 hectares, four, four dwellings equates to eight dwellings per hectare. Um, it, it doesn't provide any, any additional commentary upon that. Um, the dwellings that are proposed are three and four bedroom um, dwellings, and the, the, the scheme that is um, already built on the site, if I can just check, is itself a four bedroom dwelling as well. So yes, they are large dwellings, but at a relatively low density. Thank you for that. Is there any further, any further technical questions? Okay, committee. Uh, before I continue, members, committee meetings are limited to three hours duration unless the majority of members present ballot for the meeting to be continued. It is therefore necessary to take a vote to resume the meeting beyond that limit. I will now take a vote by a show of hands. All those in favour of extending the meeting. Thank you. Following the conclusion of this particular item, I will uh, I will bring the morning session uh, to a close and and uh, and retire for lunch, uh, and then resume uh, later. But I'll conclude this particular item first. Okay. There's no more technical questions. 
Uh, right, I now open the debate to members. Who wishes to speak? Thank you, Chair. A um, number of points. Um, Councillor Kimber raised the issue of it being outside the defined development boundary. Um, paragraph 12 of the MPPF says the presumption in favour of sustainable development does not change the statutory status of the development plan. Sus 2 on the still existing um, West Dorset, Weymouth and Portland local plan says SUS2, this is power three, outside defined development boundaries, development will be strictly controlled, having particular regard to the need for the protection of the countryside and environmental constraints and be restricted to, and therefore provides a list of places that will be, developments that will be permitted. Open market housing is not on that list. Secondly, we talk a lot about sustainable development. This week, uh, the UN's Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change published its latest report, which, to be honest, was scary. Things are far worse than we thought, they said, and we have a small window closing fast. The report puts much focus on climate-resilient development. As Councillor Bowell said, um, sustainable development is defined in the MPPF, Power 7, as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. This building on green belt land, on greenfield sites, will permanently harm the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And it by no means meets the needs of the current generation. And lastly, just to point out, you may get the impression I'm inclining to be against this development. If we can go to, just bear with me a minute, I need to get another document up. MPPF paragraph 14, which, sorry, 14. It says in situations where the presumption Paragraph 11D applies to applications involving the provision of housing. The adverse impact of allowing development that conflicts with the neighbourhood plan is likely to significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits provided all the following apply. The neighbourhood plan became part of the development plan two years or less before the date the decision is made. It is recent. It's less than two years, the neighbourhood plan. The neighbourhood plan contains policies and allocations to meet its identified housing requirement. It does. The local planning authority has at least three years supply of deliverable housing sites. I'm under the impression it does. And lastly, the local planning authority's housing delivery was at least 45% of that required over the previous three years. That's the only question I have. I'm assuming that it does. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kemp. Kemp. Clayton. Do we have any other speakers? Okay. Oh, Councillor Williams. Oh, I beg your pardon, uh, Councillor Williams. I apologise. Um, yeah, just on the... Um, um, transport aspects of this, and the need, and the need, the need there will be to uh, to use cars. I conclude. I, I totally agree with um, my fellow council, Mr. Bellwell. I know this area well. I have lived in Bridport for many years, and walked in this area. I would not walk down Broad Lane in bright sunshine, let alone on a rainy day. It is a dangerous road. Traffic comes out of Bridport and then there it's, there's no um, speed limit once you get out of Bridport. Traffic goes fast up there. There is agricultural traffic on that road and, and down Rotten Main. It is not a walkable, uh, walkable route. There will be, people will be relying on cars. 
this is very unlike the Hearst Farm site, which has a transport plan, has a bus route past it. And I just can't see that a, an extra house with parking for four cars is sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Councillor Kemba. Chair, I know we've gone past the technical questions. Can I, uh, with your indulgence, could we, I, we see the map showing Broad Lane, please, if that's possible. If that... Can you make that out, Councillor Kimber? Yes. Are you satisfied, Councillor Kimber? Yes. Okay, any other speakers? Okay. I will propose rejection of this application, Chair, um, citing that it is contrary to paragraph 7, it is not sustainable, and paragraph 12 strokes sus 2 of the local, sus 3, is it? Sus, I've lost my notes now. Somebody help me. Sus, sus 2 of the local plan, power 3, uh, is outside development, defined development boundary and does not meet any of the criteria. Do we have a seconder? Do we wish to speak? Uh, just a second. Members, we have a proposal to, uh, to reject the application, which has duly been seconded. Can I take a vote on that by hand, please? Just a moment before you do so, there's a point that needs to be clarified. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just obviously want to draw to a member's attention that we, um, members did, not to say the members of this committee, but the planning committee did refuse the previous application for two dwellings and um, the appeal was allowed. We lost that appeal. Um, and that refusal was based on, um, partly based on the sustainable location of the development, and the inspector considered it to be a sustainable location for development. So I just want to draw that to members' attention, really, um, just to be clear on that. Um, and I hear what you're saying about it being outside the DDB, but if that's the route we're going in terms of a reasoned refusal, can we just be clear about what aspect of it is unsustainable? Thank you, Chair. Do we have reasons for refusal? Well, I, I can only reiterate my point about not taking the implications of climate seriously enough. I think we are taking a, a much too shallow economic view of sustainable development and not taking the full implications of building on greenfield sites seriously. 
the, I know it's not in our plan, but I, from my own personal view, we should be looking at only developing on brownfield sites wherever possible. And bearing in mind the amount of development going on or proposed in Bridport, I just do not see this as sustainable or necessary. How does that stand up for reasons? Chair, we couldn't refer to only developing on brownfield sites because as Councillor Clayton acknowledges, we don't have a policy in our plan that requires that. Um, so yes, that's, that's, that's my response really. Um, yeah, we couldn't refuse it on the basis of it being a greenfield site. There'd have to be some identified harm to it. I'm going to bring in the um, solicitor just to make a few a comment for a moment, if I may. Um, so I, th I think we need to remind ourselves, as has been highlighted by um, our, our planning colleagues here, that the statutory basis for the decision that we're making here is the development plan unless there are material considerations that, that warrant us to step away from the plan. Now, as has been highlighted within the report here, um, we are unable to demonstrate our, our five-year housing supply. That does mean that some of those policies um, would be considered to be out of date. So some of the... Um, some of those policies must be given reduced weight. So it is for you as the decision makers to determine what weight you are going to give to those, those policies. But in, in your um, officer's decision, that the planning balance favours inside of granting permission. Thank you. Could I try referring to power 14, which refers to the neighbourhood plan, an up-to-date neighbourhood plan being in place, which is less than two years old. It contains policies to meet its identified housing requirement. Oh, sorry. Councillor, um, in respect of paragraph 14, um, the requirement is, it, it needs to meet all of the requirements of paragraph 14, which include the plan being up to date, there being a three year housing land supply and the plan including allocations for housing to meet the needs for housing. Um, and so the, um, the Bridport neighbourhood plan does not meet those requirements. Uh, the, the allocations for specific allocations for housing. That allocation is within the local plan, not the neighbourhood plan. Councillor Kimber. Uh, Chair, I was always under the opinion that the neighbourhood plan can override the main plan. I just wonder, well, my question it really is, well, what is the standing of the neighbourhood plan in this case? Go back to you, Tom. So the, the neighbourhood plan is... Um, is a made plan. It, is, it does form part of the development plan against which decisions are considered. Um, but the requirements of paragraph 14 have not been met because it does not include a specific housing allocation within that plan. So that there, those, those specific requirements of paragraph 14 are, are not met. Bearing what's just been said in mind, that we've got a proposal uh, 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 placed before us uh, to uh, oppose the, uh, uh, the uh, um, proposal, 
uh, which has duly been seconded. I will now take a vote by show of hands against that particular proposal, please. They're voting to refuse. Thank you. For those who are in favor of a rejection, show of hands, please. Y yes. Sorry. Sorry, Chair. I still wasn't clear on the reason for refusal. Given the comments of uh, Hannah, Tom, and myself, um, I think we need to make it clear what that reason is going to be. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I understand exactly what you were, were saying about um, uh, the inspector approved saying that despite the fact that we thought two, two dwellings were, were not sustainable, he felt it was. And I can't find exactly um, uh, your wording now, but your feeling was that one further, uh, under the climate change agenda, um, one further dwelling was um, of little significance or, or not particularly, you know, one more would not be particularly significant. But since that time, um, circumstances have changed. Uh, and I don't, I, I, I don't know whether um, the inspector, one would hope that inspectors in the future will be working on the basis of circumstances have changed. We, as we've just been told by Councillor Clayton, we are now being told that we have to do something now. We can't leave it for next year or the year after. It, this demonstrates how important it is that we get our local plan completed and that neighborhood plans and, and uh, other plans are all completed uh, very quickly so that they can um, reflect the changes in, in the environment and, and the urgency of climate change mitigations. But can we not um, assume or hope that any future inspectors will be seeing, will be regarding this as not, not too significant? An extra house is significant. Every single building that we do now is significant towards the future. I don't want to sound emotive here, but towards the future of the planet. And we all have a, 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 a responsibility towards that. And I think that that's what we're trying to reflect, that we, we, we have to stop building and building and building on every little site. We've proved the, the um, sustainability on the Verse Farm site. It's not proven to me that this, this site is sustainable. And I'm not, I, I'd like to think that it won't be proven to any um, inspector should the applicant choose to appeal our decision. They do have approval for two. Um, I think, you know, we, 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 we heard from Councillor Gray earlier, we can't be money motivated all the time. We've got to start thinking about the future and our future generations. Chair, um, if I could just read an extract from the inspector's report in respect to the appeal for the two dwellings. With regards to the accessibility of services and facilities, by reason of the very short distance between the site and Bridport Town, and given that the nature of the highway connecting the site to Bridport would be unlikely to deter the use of sustainable transport operations, 
Overall, I consider that the appeal scheme would appear to be adequately located, benefiting from good access by means of walking or cycling, which would thus help reduce the reliance on motor vehicles. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Williams. I'm sure the um, inspector went and, or I, I have heard that the inspector actually went to look at the site. I would totally disagree with that statement. You wouldn't walk down that, la that lane to go shopping. You certainly wouldn't push a push chair down that lane. There is a lot of traffic on that lane. That lane connects um, Leisure Centre to uh, Morrison's to Eat. Um, and uh, as I think has been said, that the traffic is likely to increase on that lane once um, the farm development or Foundry Lee, as it's now called, development goes through. So I, I, I disagree with the, what the inspector has said there, and I think we should be uh, refusing this application on, I've lost where I am, S, is it SO? Uh, SS2. No, 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 on the transport. Hmm? Lost where it is. <coughs> Sorry, Paul? It's, it's just not walkable. I'm sorry. It, people will be relying on a car to drive, drive to that. Okay. Can I come back in a moment when I find a page of the policy I'm looking for? Thank you, Councillor Williams. Councillor Ware. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, um, we've, we've taken a vote on this, and our vote has been to refuse the permission of this application. Um, I'll... I thought we took the vote. We, 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 we did. We did vote, but um, the officer <coughs> said on what ground? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's what I'm saying. We voted for refusal, sorry. We voted against the application. We voted for refusal of the application. No, didn't we? Sorry. I think we are still looking to establish a, um, a, reason. a reason reason for voting against refusal. And so, so what we need to, as, as your officers have advised in this case, the tilted balance is engaged. So we either need to find, um, or well, there has to be a policy um, either in the development plan or in the um, NPPF or another material consideration which provides um, um, that a clear reason for refusal. We have to show where the tilted balance is engaged that the adverse impacts of letting this development go forth would significantly and demonstrably, I think is the key phrase here, outweigh the benefits when we're assessing it against the development plan with some of those policies being given reduced weight because of the tilted balance. And the, the fact that we also have, as a material consideration, this um, excellent permission for two dwellings already. Um, so, as I've said, the when we're looking at a... Um, a planning application, the starting point in law is that we will um, determine whether to grant or refuse planning permission on the basis of what is included in our development plan. So that includes our local plan and our neighbourhood plan. We can also look into um, any other material considerations, um, which isn't defined in the statute, but there is guidance as to what those are. The um, MPPF provides that if the council cannot demonstrate um, a five-year supply of deliverable housing sites, 
or if we are um, failing the required levels on our housing delivery test, then um, for the purposes of paragraph 11D of the NGPS, the um, policy, the, the tilted balance should be considered, um, it should be considered whether the tilted balance in favor of, of sustainable development is um, engaged. What we then have to do is um, look at the policies that are most important to this decision before us. We have to determine whether those are um, out of date and then make a determination as to the weight which we will afford those in this planning balance. Now, just because um, a, a policy may be considered um, out of date, as was highlighted earlier, that it doesn't mean that it isn't given any weight, it's given reduced weight, and the level of weight will depend upon the factors relevant to that decision. I don't know if that answers, it's fairly complex. <laughs> Is that any help? <laughs> Thank you. So what you're saying, as from uh, the uh, last official data on uh, housing, which was 2020, I believe, uh, we had a 4.97 housing supply, which is 0.3% away, that um, we should actually, could actually use, have very, actually very little weight on, um, on accepting this plan. Um, and uh, it's greater, greater weight on uh, refusing the plan because it's not sustainable, it's not uh, delivering that, the need for housing in an area outside the development boundary. Is that what you're saying? Uh, what, what I am saying is the, the fact that the development is outside of the signed development boundary would usually, if the tilted balance was not engaged, provide us with a clear reason for refusal because those boundaries are defined to ensure that development is sustainable. The fact that we do cannot um, demonstrate a five-year housing supply means that that policy needs to be considered as to, to whether it is out of date. The NGPF advises that it is because we're not meeting that supply. Um, and so in our, in our planning balance, we have to give that reduced weight. But the, the weight that is given to it is up for you to determine as the decision maker. And as you say, the, the fact that we are, um, it's, it's a 0.3 below the five-year housing supply is relevant to, to the weight that is given. Does the same... Oh. If it's only fractionally, and we do mean here fractionally below the five-year level, does that not reduce the weight of that? So you're, you're looking at... Um, once, once we've got one policy that is um, considered out of date, we're then looking at the basket of policies that are relevant to making the decision. So um, you need to look at um, each of those policies. And yes, because we are um, be because we are close to the five-year housing supply, you can give that a greater weight than you would if we were further away. Does that answer your question? Councillor Ware. Thank you, Chairman. I, I find that we as a planning committee are in a very difficult situation because the general weight of opinion is that we would like to refuse this planning application. However, the officers are telling us that we have no substantial grounds in order to refuse that planning application. Therefore, I see little point in us sitting as a planning committee at this point in time, because we are opposed, you know, to what our officers are recommending to, you know, the majority of us are, um, but we cannot come up with a legalese reason for refusing it. So 
if we're put in a position where there is no valid reason for us to refuse an application that comes before the planning committee because the weight of the evidence is um, for approval, then why do we sit here in the first place? Thank you. Councillor Weller. Uh, so unmuted. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Worth has rather um, stolen my thunder there. Uh, it's quite all right. Um, it, it, it shows great minds. Um, until we have a robust local plan, I come back to that, and I'm sure that Councillor Walsh will be delighted that I keep saying this, um, but until we have a, a robust local plan that covers the whole of the Dorset Council area, we're going to come up with this time and time again. Um, if our officers, and I'm, I'm, I'm not denigrating the work that you've done at all, and I know that you've made your decision on all the guidelines that you're given, um, but if we don't agree with you, Often we do, but sometimes we don't. And if we don't agree with you, as in this case, that is sort of hard luck, isn't it? Because we can all say, no, we don't want this, but we have no grounds for doing so. So like Councillor Worth, I wonder what we've been doing for the last half an hour, three quarters of an hour, whatever it was, because we're, we're going through the motions, aren't we? Um, but we have, we have no, no, no teeth. Our opinion is that there shouldn't be three additional houses on that site, but we have no way of stopping it. You know, that's the, that, that's the simple fact of the matter, it would seem. And I find that incredibly frustrating. I've sat on planning um, uh, committees now for 20 years, and every meeting now, I wonder why I'm doing it. Um, it it's it's very, very disheartening. Thank you, Chair. It's not to say that members can't refuse it. You are there to make a decision as you so wish. We just need to understand as officers what that reason for refusal is. And as Anna said on the previous item, we will obviously provide our professional advice and point out what are the relevant material considerations and policies. You know, planning is a subjective matter, but it's for you to provide us with reasons for refusal. And just saying, obviously, we, we don't accept three houses on this site. We need to be clear as to why. We've told you why, but it's not valid, apparently. Can I just call you, Chef? Is, is, is the suggestion, as, as from the previous debate, that the, um, the development um, poses a, a severe risk to the, uh, or a severe impact on the highway network? Is that what we're saying? There seem to be a lot of comments regarding the access to the site. Sorry. No, I'm not saying that, but it is not um, sus sustainable to an acti active travel plan. Um, which is uh, in the NFP policy, I believe. Um, but just a couple of other comments. Um, I think we heard from one of the local residents about um, light pollution from a one, one bungalow and her concerns on that. So could we look at that as a possible reason for... Um, I'm, no, I'm not meant to refer to uh, previous planning applications, uh, but uh, I think we, that was referred to by uh, the officer in the in, when reading out from the inspector's report. And we have seen that this, this layout 
is very different from what uh, the inspector passed. It is a, a grid system with a road running straight through towards, uh, towards the AMB, and I don't understand why the road is actually running beyond the garages that, that it is feeding. Um, I think um, the, the layout and design of this is It's urban. It is not a rural. It's not a rural layout. The the uh, one that the inspector passed, uh, agreed to or passed, had a much more rural layout. And if you look at the wider, wider scene of um, the Broadain area, it's ver it's very much more rural layout of of properties. So again, I think that is a reason for potential reason for refusal. Don't know if anybody, any other committee members would like to comment on that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, Chairman, whether, given the time, um, we take our recess now, ask our officers to go away and look for uh, 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 suitable reasons that, that you've got a pretty good idea of how we want to vote. We want um, some support for 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 that. It, you know, and if it if it is that um, after you've taken the time, you really can't find any justification for um, how we feel, then tell us that. Um, but we could back round thinking, you know. We could be here for another half an hour, another hour, saying, well, what about this and what about this, with you saying, no, that doesn't quite work. And I'm really, I, I, I'm really not getting at you here because I know that you're trying to help us. Um, but it might be easier if you can go back to your desks or sit there with your laptops or whatever it is and see if you can find something that will help us achieve what we want to achieve. Um, and that might be a better use of all of our time. I don't know if uh, members of the committee have access to the NPPF document, but on page six, uh, where it says, where, where there are no relevant development plan policies or the policies which are most important for determining the applications are out of date, granting permission, granting permission unless the application of policies in the framework that protected areas of the assets of particular importance provides a clear reason for refusing the development proposed, or any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when assessed against the policies in the framework taken as a whole. That's, that's as laid out in the NPPF, and I thought it might be re relevant on this particular occasion. Councillor Kimber. Uh, Chair, fellow councillors, fellow officers, Councillor Waller has given a good way forward around this, that we take our lunch break now to allow the officers to give them time to to look at this there is areas that we've got uh, concern also uh, broad lane we've heard is not su suitable level of traffic for, for, for the extra traffic it's gonna... so i would uh, request that we take our lunch break now and let the officers come back to us and to see if they can sort this impasse out. Um, I've been like Councillor Weller, I've been on planning committees tw over 20 years, and this was something that we, from time to time, you'd, you, a planning committee is gonna get stuck. It's night follows day. And this, maybe the, this is something that we can ask our officers that, ask our officers to have a, have a look when we come back. Thank you. I propose that that probably is a very good idea, and I will call oh, us to have a lunch break. Uh, I don't know how long does the committee suggests 
An hour, three quarters of an hour. Half an hour, half an hour. So how long would you would you propose an hour? Forty-five minutes. <coughs> Is everyone in agreement with forty-five minutes? Members of the public, yeah, you would obviously want to stay for the rest of that. Are you happy with a forty-five minute break so that we can? Is that okay? All right. Okay. I know, I know therefore, um, I adjourn the meeting for 45 minutes for us to take some breath.
Good afternoon, committee, and welcome to any new members of the public joining the afternoon session of the Western and Southern Area Planning Committee meeting. I've just done a check of the committee uh, members, and they're all, all present. So we'll continue with our deliberation on uh, item 5C. So I'll hand over to the officers. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, let me just get my computer to the right bit. So, uh, having listened to the debate and the issues that members raised, um, we have put them into a form of wording, which Tom will just share on the screen. Brilliant. Oh, we'll zoom in a bit. I will read it out as well, don't worry. But, um, so, Having regard to the formal layout of the development in a grid-like pattern, this would result in the development having an urban character contrary to its rural location within the AOMB and outside the defined development boundary of Bridport. Furthermore, the proposed development would result in additional artificial light in the AOMB contrary to the prevailing landscape character. Hence, the proposed development would be contrary to policies EMB1 and EMB2 of the West Dorset, Weymouth, EMV 12, yes, yeah, sorry, of the West Dorset, Weymouth and Portland Local Plan 2015 and paragraph 130, 174 and 176 of the National Planning Policy Framework 2021. Right, going back to the the proposer and seconder, um, have you had a look at the wordings as laid out on screen? Thank you, Chair, and thank you, officers. Um, personally, I would have preferred my arguments about climate, but for the sake of brevity, as the, the end result is hopefully the same, I will accept that with my proposal to refuse. Second. The proposer and seconder agree with the, the wordings as laid out on screen. Uh, so um, to, I will need to retake the vote, won't I? Yeah, the vote was interrupted, that's what I assumed. Okay, right, bearing that in mind then, could I, um, with that form of word as shown, shown on screen, and Having checked with the updates, etc., as laid out in your paper, in your paperwork, uh, can we take a show of hands on the recommendation? Okay. Right. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. None against and one, one abstention. Right, committee and members of the public, we now have to take item 5D on the agenda. And this is a, these are planning in principle applications. And this is P, PIP 
2021-03739 land southeast of Southwell Business Park, Sweet Hill Road, Portland, and that's for the erection of up to two dwellings. And I now invite Thomas Wilde, the case officer, to introduce this item. Over to you, Thomas. Um, this application is application reference P slash PIP 2021-03739, land southeast of Southwell Business Park, Sweet Hill Road, Portland, for the erection of up to two dwellings. <coughs> First slide here shows the site location outlined in red. Um, we have Sweet Hill Road here running through the site, uh, running to the north of the site, and the Southwell Business Park to the west. Um, and Southwell up to the north of the site. Um, this is there we go. Um, this is an aerial photograph of the site um, at present. You can see it's um, currently undeveloped. Um, it sits right on the southern boundary of the site. There is a, an access um, to land nine to the south, which which is to the south um, east of the site. Um, and we have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, this photo of the site taken um, from the east. Um, so the site is showing centrally, the concrete access is showing um, going off to the left of the photograph, the Sweet Hill Road um, to the right. And this is taking looking in the opposite direction with the site um, to, uh, centrally here. Um, residential development on the other side of Sweet Hill Road um, and other open land to the um, right hand side of the screen. Um, it is worth mentioning at this stage, um, permission in principle has previously been granted on this land to the right hand side for uh, construction of up to eight dwellings. Um, and I think a, a technical details consent is, is either submitted on that or shortly to be submitted, as I understand it. Um, this application is for permission in principle only. Um, so the only issue for consideration today is the principle of development. Um, as we've heard previously in previous items, the presumption in favor of, of sustainable development applies. Um, this site is located outside of the defined development boundary, um, but it's considered that the site would be well re related to the development boundary um, and owing to the um, both the nature of development in the vicinity and extant consents which lie either side of the site, um, it would not result in an uncharacteristic expansion of the settlement beyond established limits. Um, and it's also been considered by the mineral safeguarding team who don't have any objection. Therefore, the recommendation is to grant permission in principle subject to recommended conditions for the three-year time limit, approved plans, uh, requiring technical details consent to be applied for and approved within three years and oh, and sorry and for a maximum of two dwellings on the site thank you chair thank you thomas are there any questions of a technical nature for the case officer councillor kimber um Thank you, Chair. I just wonder if we can go back to the photograph of the um, proposed development site at Sweet Hill Road. Thank you. Um, as you'll see on the right, this is an area that is still undeveloped, and development on Portland at the moment is going ahead at a, a massive rate. and. Uh, what I would say is, first off, the, this area of land is now starting to work towards what I always say, Portland Bill. Now, that area I've always considered actually sacrosanct because it hasn't been developed until you get, actually get down to the Portland Bill itself and there is a small, a small settlement down there. I believe this 
So um, what I want to say on the technical nature is, what did you look at the land and the quality of the land and the soil there? That's my question. And I'm looking even here, I can see definite wildflowers. Um, so no, that, that wouldn't have been looked at for, for this application in terms of soil quality and matters such as biodiversity because um, as the application is for permission in principle only, um, we are prevented from requiring any additional information other than sufficient information to identify the site and the amount of development proposed. Um, all matters such as impacts on biodiversity, access, design, everything that we'd normally expect to see in a planning application would be considered at the later technical details consent stage. Councillor Dempsey. Thank you. It does mention a footpath being adjacent to this site. Could you point it out, please, on the map? Or is it that um, that path or that track that's covered with concrete? I have actually got the definitive map uh, saved into my report. So the, the root of the footpath is this mauve maroon colour, which, which kind of follows round. So it's on the south western side of the site um, and it, it then diverts out to, oh, that's gone the wrong way sorry um, so it, it you can see it curves around to the west and and travels to the south as well so um, the the line of the footpath runs along the, the kind of the southwestern boundary so um, the view has taken that while the, the development site contains a footpath that the location of the footpath is such that it wouldn't necessarily prevent development coming forward Are there any uh, t further technical questions, please? Councillor Kemba. Could I just request that the slide is expanded so you can see, in, in the committee can see, in relation to the sea and the peninsula this, this, this is a part of? Apologies, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas. As, as you can see, that you're now coming into that open area of space that uh, uh, people enjoy. There's an enormous amount of walking there, and there is enormous amount, also an um, enormous amount of archaeology in, in that area. Um, my question is, is, the, is that concern that we're starting to creep our way south towards the Portland Bill and we're going to lose that, um, that beautiful open space? Sorry, would you like a response on that point? Sorry, so, yeah, I'm sorry, Councillor. Um, if I just bring back my slideshow there. Which, sorry. Need to 
So if, um, it's probably best if we look at my slideshow for the, the site here, which is a bit, little bit more closely zoomed in. Um, the, the recommendation is, is in part based on the fact that we have already um, development on the southern side of Sweet Hill Road to the east of the site. Um, and the land that I'm just indicating here with the mouse um, to the immediately to the west also benefits from permission in principle. So um, effectively, this is this is the only part of that that area that hasn't got either development or a consent for development. Um, so the 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 view is is that on balance that the development of this this parcel would not um, would not result in a significant diminishment of that open space. Thank you for that. Is there any further questions of a technical nature? No, I now have... Is that a technical question, Councillor Clayton? Oh, yes, please, then. It's a very technical question. It's my ignorance here. What's the difference between an application in principle and an outline application? Um, it's essentially the amount of information that is required as part of the, ap as a, as part of the application process. Um, an outline application can have quite a lot of detail approved as part of it. Um, so it, a lot of, uh, some agents can apply for the design, layout, siting of development to be um, approved as part of an, an outline application. Um, whereas permission in principle is solely the boundary of the site and the quantum of development. Um, so we don't consider any of those issues around access, siting, landscaping, those types of things. Thank you, members. I now open the debate uh, uh, Debate to members. Are there any one wishing to speak? Councillor Kimber. Chair, fellow councillors, uh, fellow officers, um, I'm going to move, once again, we are looking at a site that's outside the development boundary. And I'm going to move that this is not supported as because this would be overdevelopment within this boundary. Uh, the site is adjacent to a S SNCI request, and I could also request an archaeological survey should be carried out prior, to, you know, as as well. Um, I also note that this could be a dangerous development in relation to vehicle movements. We draw attention to the loss of landscape and we note there's been no consult consultation over mineral rights. Um, so that is my, I'll move that if I've got a seconder. Yeah. Clarify, um, there, there we have had a consultation on mineral rights um, and there was no objection. Uh, over to you, Anne. And in respect of highway safety, highways had no objection. Sorry, Chair. No, no I, I still, be, I still, still believe this could be an overdevelopment of the site and that area. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Councillor Willer. I'd like to propose that we accept the re recommendation. Um, we have an opportunity when it comes next time to us to ask for archaeological um, investigations if we feel that that's um, appropriate. 
um, but this does seem to me to be a rationalisation of the approvals on each side. It's a, a little bit in the middle, and arguably it would be nice to keep that green, but at the same time, it is just rounding off the, 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 the site there. So um, my proposal, if I, if I have a seconder, is to accept the recommendation. Let me take these in order then. Are you proposed a uh, refusal? Do you have a seconder? Seconded then, you seconded it. Poor. Get that right in a moment. Okay, right. Those that is the the um, the uh, proposed seconded application. Go back to you, Anne. I hate to say this again, but can we just be clear on the reason for refusal? You all knew I was going to say that, didn't you? Um, so we've got overdevelopment. And out of character to the area, yeah. so it's a yeah. So just just the loss of that site. Before voting, we'd need to adjourn to actually a reason refusal. Again, I've had I've had no mention of policies mentioned to me. So we've got no reasons actually to 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 propose refusal. How are you saying? Okay. All right. Okay, would you like us to take a few moments uh, of reflection again, uh, Anne? If you're asking me to come up with a reason for refusal based on what's been said, then yes. I think as this is the preemptive uh, proposal, uh, then we've got to, uh, to actually take that one first. And uh, so therefore, um, uh, we've got to come up with the appropriate wording. Yes, please.
Gasabella. Yes, Chair. I'm just wondering, um, uh, rather than look for reasons now, we don't even know if the vote's going to be in favour, do we? And I know there's a counter proposal down at the end, so I'm just wondering if we're spending time looking at reasons to refuse this when, in fact, the committee may be minded to accept it. So. Uh, the point is that. Yeah, that, the point is that is a proposal which preempts any uh, any other proposal, and that's then got to be voted on first. And if that gets voted down, then that that then means it uh, we take the the formal proposal. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Chairman, chairman, but but we may be we may be asking the officers to spend five minutes doing a piece of work that they don't need to do. Um, Got to be done, I'm afraid, Kate. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. No, I can't. Uh, what I do, I've got to vote on the proposal in second. But it's been seconded, you see. I think if we take a vote, we have to, and, 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 and it refused, we have to have a reason why members were voting on that. We can't vote. Over to you. Tom, 
just bring it up on the screen and then I'll read it out for you, Chair. So we, we've written something. Tom will just share it on the screen in a minute and then I'll um, read it out for you. Bear with us. So the proposed development would result in the loss of and overdevelopment of a green space outside of the defined development boundary to the detriment of the visual amenity and character of the area. Hence, the proposed development is contrary to policy EMV1 of the West Dorset, Weymouth and Portland Local Plan 2015 and policy port slash CR4 of the Portland Neighbourhood Plan 2021. And put the year in the end. We'll put the year at the end. Can can see? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can see? You're happy? You're happy with that wording? Mr. Clayton, you're happy with that wording? Can see Williams? You wanted to speak. Oh, try, try. Okay, okay. We've uh, we've now got a proposal and a seconder for uh, refusal of this particular application, uh, uh, and I will take a vote by show of hands. All those in favour of rejection. Three. Those against? Three. Four. Four. That proposal therefore falls. We do have a, a proposal for acceptance of the main uh, proposition. Councillor Thank you. We now have a proposal and a seconder for the main uh, um, uh, application. Any other comments from anyone? Councillor Kimber. Um, We can't impose conditions at this particular point because there's a PIP. Okay. Thank you. We now go to item 5E on the agenda. That's uh, P PIP 2021-03738, land north of 69 to 72, Reclaim, Portland. And that's the erection of up to two dwellings. I now invite Thomas Wild, the case officer, to introduce this item. Um, so the application is reference P slash PIP slash 2021-03738, land north of 69 to 72, Reap Lane, Portland. Um, uh, permission in principle for the erection of up to two dwellings. Uh, the site uh, area is as shown on the plan in front of you at the moment. Um, it's uh, 
roughly rectangular piece of land um, with housing uh, immediately to the northeast and southwest. Um, this is an aerial photograph of the site. Um, it's currently a, an area of green open space, um, effectively left, left over after um, recent development. Um, here we have a view of the site from um, Route Lane. The, as you can see, the, so the site is centrally located here. Um, the, the site runs to approximately the um, desire line that you can see here. Um, we have dwellings fronting onto the site to the northeast and southwest, and you can see this structure centrally in, in the view here is a um, electricity substation. Um, once again, the um, application is for per permission in principle, so the, the, issue, the only issue for consideration is the principle of development. Um, we, we are, the, the, sorry, the, the um, factors going into that are the presumption in favour of st sustainable development applying. Um, the site, for, uh, once again, is lo located outside of the defined development boundary um, and is also within an area which has been identified as an important open gap. Um, however, it, it's, as, it's viewed that in this case the site location means that there would not be a significant reduction in the openness of the gap um, and the site would still be well related to the development boundary and would not result in an uncharacteristic expansion of the settlement. Um, and once again, there is no mineral safeguarding ob um, objection on the site. Therefore, the recommendation is that the committee grant permission in principle subject to the recommended conditions, which are the three-year time limit, approved plans, requirement for de technical details, consent to be applied for and approved within three years, and there to be a maximum of two dwellings on the site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thomas. Are there any questions of a technical nature for the case officer? Councillor Kimber. I understand there is a, a gas main. I know, I know this site quite well because uh, when I was on Dors Dorset County Council, we had to um, develop a right of way around this site. Um, I understand there is a gas main and a, possibly a substation in, in that area. Has this been taken into consideration? Um. Thank you, Councillor. The substation is as shown here on this plan. If I just zoom in slightly, um, you, should, you might be able to see it a little bit more clearly. Uh, it's this uh, brick-built structure. Um, the presence of a gas main was referred to in representations on the application, but that's not been, it's not been possible to verify that. We do have um, mapping available of um, all of gas mains in, in the area, and there is no there is no record of there being any, any gas main mapped to this site. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, is there any other further technical questions for the case officer? Right. Oh, Councillor Ware. Sorry, sorry, Chairman, I assumed we'd finish with the technical and we're going on to the other questions, so I was uh, putting my input in. Wait, not to wait, not to wait. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Uh, that's, uh, that's duly seconded. Are there any other comments? Then I will take a vote by show of hands. That has been duly proposed and seconded. All those in favour? That's 7-4.
those against? One, seven, one. No abstentions. That therefore is carried. Thank you very much indeed, committee. Committee, we now take item 5F on the agenda, which is the, the last planning application. Thank you, Tom. Uh, on, the, on the agenda. And that is uh, a, uh, uh, the, a um, PLBC 2021-03958 Guncliff SPS, Bridge Street, Lyme Regis, and that's to install an external 4G antenna to the outside wall. I now invite Charlotte Loveridge, the case officer, to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is, um, as has already been said, application P slash LBC slash 2021 slash 03958, which is the Guncliffe uh, sewage pumping station, Bridge Street, Lyme Regis, um, for the installation of a 4G antenna on the outside wall. Uh, this map shows the location of the site, um, which shows it's just to the south of the Marine Theatre, um, and just to the east you've got the Guild Hall, Lyme Regis Museum, um, and obviously the foreshore, um, the sort of end section of the Marine Parade um, to the south of it. Uh, this is a slightly more closer shot. The Green Star essentially is the location of where uh, the antenna is proposed to be. Um, and here is a aerial view of it, which shows the proximity obviously there to the foreshore at Lyme Regis. Um, and as I say, you've got the Marine Theatre there. Um, the gun walls are a grade two listed building um, and the buildings surrounding a grade two um, with the guild hall being a grade two star listed. Um, the reason for the application coming to committee is because um, the proposal is on Dorset Council leasehold land. Um, and if you see on this plan, the darker purple areas are Dorset Council freehold land. The lighter purple are the Dorset Council leasehold and licensed land, which is where the proposal actually lies. Um, so the planning history is um, 1991 application was um, for the construction of new sea walls, uh, new bridge over the River Lim, stormwater storage tanks and sewage pumping station, which was all constructed in the early 1990s. Um, the proposal itself, the actual principle of the development is not um, up for... Um, the proposal because that is under the statutory undertaking permitted development rights that Southwest Water have. Um, so essentially it's for the 30 centimetre high 4G aerial and the cabling um, along the listed building uh, walls and to assess the heritage, any harm to the heritage assets. So this is a um, photograph of the site location. Here are the double doors um, that are the entrance to the sewage pumping station. Um, the walls are nearly, well, just over six foot high, uh, six meters high, sorry. And the aerial, as you can see, would be situated just over 70 centimeters from the top of the uh, gun walls, just at the top of the buttress there. Uh, this picture shows the where the routing of where the cable would go, which would basically go along existing mortar lines up the join of where the buttress meets the wall, um, and it would drill through the sort of metered thick wall um, to be powered into the sewage pumping station. Um, as I say, the principle of development is um, basically, it, it's the statutory undertaker um, under the permitted development right, so it is just the listed building um, aspects that we're assessing. And 
scale of the proposal is very minimal. The location has been largely determined by the subterranean nature of the building. Um, as I say, it's the anten antenna unit itself is only 30 centimetres in height with the uh, mounting plate and will be at the top of the buttress wall. Um, the antenna and cabling will be painted to match the colour of the stonework as closely as possible. Um, so the impact on the heritage assets, um, it's acknowledged that obviously it will need to be, the cable will need to be drilled through the one metre thick wall near to the door frame of the double gates. Um, it's been designed to create a minimal visual intrusion and this will create a less than substantial harm which will be offset by the public benefit of the proposal. And the public benefit is the reduced risk of failure for the critical process control communications between the Guncliff sewage pumping station with upline sewage treatment works where it all goes um, to be treated before discharge. And this is because BT Openreach are renewing some of their older um, copper wires. And so the 4G radio is basically to replace that and pro to provide a fallback communication between the two sites um, for the newly installed FTTC, uh, which is fibre to the cabinet uh, circuits at both sites. So the recommendation is that the committee be minded to delegate authority to the head of planning to grant listed building consent subject to conditions and subject to the, there being no adverse comment received by the leaseholder on the lapse of the 21 days notice served on them by the applicant, um, and which will expire on the 10th of March. The recommended conditions for this would be three-year implementation, um, subject to the approved plans. The antenna and antenna cable will be painted in RAL 7030, which is stone grey. Any fixings for the routing of the antenna cable and antenna shall be fitted into the existing mortar joints. Um, and there was one slight amendment on the um, amendment sheet, which was just um, revising one of the plans on the application for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Charlotte. Are there any questions of a technical nature for the case officer? Then I will go to, I will now open the debate to members. Is there any member wishing, sorry? Councillor Wishing to, uh, to ask a question, Councillor Williams. I'm happy to uh, propose this, this uh, recommendation for approval. Got it, look, but. Councillor Kimber. Are there any comments? Then I will put it to the vote. We've got a proposal and a seconder before us. All those in favour? Any, any unanimous? I must focus on my microphone. Um, right, that, con that concludes the planning applications. Thank you, members. Um, we now take item six on the agenda, urgent items. I've had no prior notification of any item of business which is considered to be urgent, pursuant to, pursuant to section 100B, 4B of the Local Government Act, 1972. Item seven on the agenda, exempt business. I have no prior notification of any item viewed as likely to disclose exempt information within the meaning of the paragraph three of the schedule 12A to the Local Government Act 1972 as amended. Thank you very much indeed for your participation. Members of the committee, 
and public, <laughs> which no longer exists. Uh, that was a, a very interesting meeting. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And, uh, and uh, here's to the next time. Thank <laughs> you.